So let's start. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the first of the sessions, the follow-up sessions, as it were, to Digital Futures World. Um, I was going to say morning. It's, it's morning here in, in California. I know that it's evening in, in China and in, in Singapore. Um, and we have together today, we also have some of our new committee, um, the Digital Futures Young Committee, who will be taking over many of the kind of events that are be occurring. I should just say before I start introducing this uh, week's event, next week we have um, what we call Digital Futures Young. Um, these are events that we used to hold in Shanghai. We're now going to hold them online. And it's a chance for young researchers, that's to say those who recently graduated, PhD students and young uh, recently appointed academics to present their research. Um, uh, 12 minutes each. Um, and uh, uh, we start off with AI. AI seems to be one of the kind of the big themes that uh, this year, it's certainly been very pro popular. Um, and next week then, uh, at the same time, uh, we will be uh, it, having our first of our Digital Future Young events. Um, I should also mention just briefly that we have this uh, new committee, which I'll, I'll introduce them more, uh, more, uh, more, more comprehensively next week. Um, uh, a bunch of, of super young, super enthusiastic, talented individuals. Uh, I should say this all started from um, a group of them in the um, intelligence theory workshop that I ran with Sanford Quinto, Anton Pican, and Marika Trotter. They set up a, um, um, a, a, a platform on Discord for continuing debate. That is still there. If anyone is, not, is unaware of it, you can actually join Discord through our main website. Um, and uh, they will be uh, uh, taking over uh, the, the kind of running of the show or much of the running of the show um, uh, in the next couple of weeks or so. Anyway, today I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce some of our workshop instructors from the Digital Futures World um, event. Um, we have the overall 12 workshops looking at AI in different forms, including a theory workshop. And I'd say that AI really was the, the hot topic that was being debated um, during the event. Um, there are a number of, of um, uh, uh, video recordings uh, on our, our YouTube site uh, where we, um, uh, of, the, of the events that we hosted in terms of panel discussions. Um, I would particularly like to flag up the one that was done between Wolf Pricks and Tom Main. Um, introducing the way in which these, these ideas have been, are actually filtering into mainstream practice, um, or let's say progressive practice. But I think much of the work is coming from a, a, a much younger generation who are really uh, producing some remarkable work at the moment. I should also say that Matthias and I are, will be co-editing um, an issue of architectural design on machine hallucinations, on the impact of AI and architecture. And it does seem that somehow this is the kind of the, 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 the hot topic in many ways. Um, um, so what I'd like to do today then is, is really have the chance, give everyone the chance to, to talk more about what they, uh, um, uh, what happened in their workshop, um, to present some of, the, some of the outcomes and to really to share ideas and exchange ideas. Uh, in terms of the students, you only got to, to be able to take one workshop and I guess a lot of people are curious to know what was going on in the other workshops. So today is precisely um, the opportunity to go and find out more about those, those, um, those questions. So um, I'm going to call upon a number of the uh, individuals who are, who are uh, the instructors um, in the workshop. Um, I can see Matthias in front of me right now on the screen. So uh, maybe, I, uh, Matthias, would you like to maybe sort of kick off and do a, a, a brief presentation about what you were what you, what you were doing in the in the in the workshop? You, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, the good thing about these workshops that we did is that we recorded everything. Which means I, of course, did not prepare any presentation. I just kind of, you know, dial into one of those videos and just let it run and explain on the side basically things we wanted to achieve or which we actually hopefully achieved with the workshop. So, can I share my screen? Let me see. Yeah. Okay. So, do you see the video? Yes. Okay. So, basically, uh, we tried to keep the, 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 the entire workshop as, as, I would say introductory as possible because we know that there's a lot of audience out there who has never worked with AI before that uh, do not have experience with coding. Um, so we wanted to keep it simple. And for that, we actually prepared beforehand a GitHub repository, which, which contained uh, all the code necessary to run a variety of different experiments without having the necessity to really code anything. 
because we were running this code that was positioned in GitHub through a cloud computing solution called Paperspace. So even students didn't need to have large GPU machines to calculate anything. And our main aim was the conversation, like there's two different um, aspects of the conversation in the workshop. On the one side, let's say the technical necessities around uh, using AI, which kind of techniques are out there, like 2D to 2D style transfer, 3D to 3D style transfer. There's many, many more, but we focused on only two of them, yeah, just to get the result. And on the other side, the cultural implications of the of this kind of work. So we don't we didn't just introduce them to the techniques. We also introduced them to work on AI and creativity, things like what comes out of the art field in terms of painting, in terms of artwork, what does come out from the music industry, who are increasingly using also neural networks to create music. And uh, literature is actually uh, an, an, an area where automated writing has been used already for decades but of course has been taking off in the last couple of years because of the amplification possible through the use of neural networks. And with this set of elements, you, we, we ran pretty much the, the, the week was over in a second almost, uh, considering all these sort of aspects. This is the work of one of the students, the result of them, Jonas Vat van der Velde, <coughs> who is a, uh, is a graduate from the ETH. Uh, he, I think he was sitting around in Berlin the, uh, with his own company what I really liked also about these workshops is that they were not only visited by students, they were also visited by professionals and, and, and faculty. So it seems there is a really a widespread interest into this uh, innovative area of design. Just briefly about what you see here in the workshop is that we were experimenting around uh, with uh, style transferring between just two images. So we did not rely on large databases in this case, just to keep the amount of things that need to be done short and also to, to show students very clearly the effects between just two images. Uh, in many cases, those were images uh, either generated through previous work of students, like renderings they have done or photographs of models, and um, a style image that could be either a historic architectural example from Baroque or Rococo or Gothic or what they wanted and see how those two images interact and produce something that is neither nor. This is one of the things I'm most interested into in this, uh, in this uh, idea is that it's not imitating or copying a style, it's actually generating something different, strange, beautiful, exciting, ugly out of it, which can be considered uh, a discovery. And I hope that students went away from this workshop with this kind of insight. How long do you want me to talk, Neil? You're muted, Neil. Uh, keep going for the five minutes if you if you're in, in, enough material. Five minutes, okay. No, no, no problem. I mean, I just didn't know how long I have to go. I can go for an yeah, hour too if you want. Let's let's try to do about ten minutes each because I want to get some time for the to, for the overall discussion. Okay, right. so uh, so um, I think this, uh, the 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 workshop itself was fairly successful, and I'm also happy that we will continue offering this kind of insights in more detail and with more time, also for Tsinghua. Um, and uh, my thesis project, my thesis studio at Taubman College uh, is also entirely dedicated to this kind of work, but it's, it's more sophisticated than one we did in the workshop. So we are entirely working in 3D starting upcoming semester. We have been working hard with the, compu with the computer science department and robotics department of the University of Michigan to develop these techniques further so that we can really entirely work in 3D introducing aspects that are really important for us as a next step, which is, for example, semantic information, making the algorithm understand meaning, like what is it, what is a room, what is a door, what is a window, so that we, because right now we're basically just operating within style transfer as a very raw technique, I think, and now it's time to refine neural networks so that they understand better architectural qualities and ideas and how you can implement them in an architecture design in a more comprehensive way. And this is going to be the next year or so. Uh, we are also preparing, I mean, as, as Neil mentioned, uh, we're also preparing the AD about um, architecture and artificial intelligence called machine hallucinations. Funny story, just as a side note, as these ideas just fly around, and I know that uh, Refi, uh, Refik Anatol used the same term, but they, they, they originally really, uh, they, they originated independently, which is a funny thing. So. 
we were speculating around of how to uh, how to call a specific course we're doing at Taupin College. And I know that Sandra and I were arguing around whether to call it machinic hallucinations or machine hallucinations. Because Sandra was arguing that machining is the more computational methodology of thinking about things that are generating something. And I was saying, well, but it's called machine learning. It's not called machinic learning. So let's call it machine hallucinations. <laughs> All right. Okay, just, I mean, just to say, uh, first of all, I should have mentioned, I'm interesting in Matthias, that Matthias was part of the team that set this up. A huge amount of work went into, into setting up a digital futures world. Um, I'd also say that I, I'm extremely envious of Matthias in, in Michigan because he does have a very strong computer science department there um, to support him, and including uh, the, actually the, 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 the 2D to 3D um, work, which is very new, uh, um, uh, PyTorch 3D, is it PyTorch 3D? And that's part of it, yes, PyTorch 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which was developed by one of the faculty members at, at Michigan. Um, yeah, uh, maybe one more thing I would really like to thank, uh, of course, I mean, Sandra Manninger was crucial in doing this workshop, as was uh, Alexa Carlson from Michigan Robotics and Danish Sayed from Computer Science. And we had an assistant called Mike Shin, who was super helpful in get running this workshop. Right. Okay, um, let's. That that was great. Let's kind of keep maybe uh, have some questions at the at the end together. Um, I didn't see much time time we got left over. Uh, I'm aiming to go for just over two hours today, if that's okay with everyone. Um, uh, maybe uh, we could. Um, I can see in front of my screen. Uh, I can see Guvench and, and Benjamin. Um, do you guys want to go and do the next? Um, uh, are you ready to go and roll? To go to roll? Sure. Sure. I mean, uh, we will not be able to show directly what the students produced in the workshop because uh, we haven't really uh, had many responses when we were uh, checking back with them whether we could actually show the work publicly or not. But, um, but I will show exactly what we did. Um, and I will also give a little bit of context about the kind of research that uh, Benjamin and I do at UCLA and also beyond. Um, so we started um, working uh, with machine learning around, uh, I would say two and a half years ago. And, um, but uh, the, the kind of the relationship uh, between uh, what we consider to be a, a kind of a architectural uh, proposition versus interactivity was uh, heavily reliant on a narrative that was um, uh, based on an understanding of artificial intelligence. But, um, you know, kind of uh, with the intention of growing out of um, uh, the, 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 the parametric uh, um, framework uh, about generative uh, systems that are being utilized in architecture. Uh, I would say that we focused on um, primarily this, this mode of uh, operation that is about uh, intelligence rather than an intelligence system deriving uh, a kind of a design proposition. Uh, and that, that was our position, I would say, probably for like six years. Uh, the first course related to this was called Architectural Intelligence. And that was primarily looking at cyber physical systems and looking at the interaction between uh, different uh, types of uh, systems that have relative autonomy and how they can influence each other in a kind of a continuous feedback loop in terms of their behavior. Like obviously uh, considering that the, the image-based machine learning tools, which is what uh, architects can use at this point, uh, are, you know, their, their backgrounds or their public availability date back to two to two and a half years. Uh, we, we basically looked into uh, a, a couple set of uh, algorithms, like, you know, obviously one of them being the style transfer and the other ones being more the generative adversarial networks that are uh, more focused on uh, training data. And um, the first result that we wanted to uh, think about uh, in terms of style transfer was about actually looking at the significance of style uh, in architecture and how the relationship between envelope and style uh, could be highlighted uh, through a process like this. And, uh, and also our intention was to, in a way, reverse or, uh, or 
almost contentiously fight towards this kind of autonomous notion about architecture, thinking about architecture as a, as a purely isolated field that has an ability to like only feed itself. And uh, we quickly realized that actually the, the style transfer tool allows you to uh, work in a much more interdisciplinary way and, um, and think about how uh, that interdisciplinarity allow you to build much more direct bridges with other professions, other artistic expressions, other notions of uh, aesthetic exploration uh, that are not necessarily operative, that are not necessarily about the operation of a building, but, but, they, but they require a high level of cultural understanding to uh, synthesize a certain set of, um, I would say, understandings that are, that are much more visual, that are much more spatial, um, so, uh, given that, like our first explorations in, 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 mach uh, in machine learning was uh, primarily limited by style transfer, which was also the context and the content of the workshop that we taught. Uh, and it's a multi-step process, and we were only able to do uh, the first uh, two steps uh, due to the time limitations and also uh, due to the kind of scope that needs to be contained. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of work that you're seeing on the screen right now is actually the full package, uh, which was a semester long exploration when we first started doing that. And the way that it uh, originates is to first uh, use a series of cultural influences that are required to be outside of architecture. It could be something related to the culture of images, the culture of, uh, let's say, uh, representation of art, uh, you know, photography of a sculpture, uh, photography of, um, of fashion photography, uh, painting, and all these different kinds of fields, uh, we create, created a, a more user-friendly interface uh, for the students to actually uh, sample those influences in terms of almost like a percentage into how much affect they're going to um, enforce onto an image. And as images, what we decided to do was to use an existing building, use an existing building that has already some level of iconic value and, uh, and also use this as an opportunity to kind of reinvent that building. So what we would do is that we would uh, make the students pick a, a kind of a, a set of images and then uh, they would isolate uh, a drone footage of that uh, particular uh, of, of, of any building uh, and in this case at UCLA we gave them five buildings that they could pick from and then use the style transfer process to um, transform the envelope of the building and then once that uh, transformation happens you're in a way reverse engineering the design of the building from an outside in type of perspective and approach so uh, the kind of results that, that, that they yield is, is very different than the, the kind of the GAN generated, uh, I would say, crap shoot type of uh, approach, which is more about uh, creating a massive data set and then allowing the data set to fully take control of, uh, of the content. Um, so I would say that uh, if you're, if, when you're working with a style transfer as a starting point, and, uh, and one of my colleagues actually one time uh, when I was sharing uh, this, uh, this methodology uh, said something along the lines of, oh, style transfer is like the kiddie pool of uh, AI. You know, it's not, it's not really, uh, you know, the, 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 the holy grail or what have you. But to me, it's really not about the process. I think as a profession, we really need to move on from fetishizing a process because uh, the world doesn't care about the process. Uh, the world cares about how we use that process uh, to connect our output into a much larger cultural paradigm. So uh, in that regard, to me, uh, the use of um, uh, style transfer is almost like using Photoshop uh, in the sense that it allows you to sample different kind of cultural influences uh, into, into an image making process, which is a starting point uh, that uh, allows you to further develop that in a much more articulated way 
within the tools of architecture, uh, within the tools of digital architecture, right? So uh, our method, uh, just to go back to that video, was that uh, first uh, you uh, generate the video with the style transfer tool, and then you go back and then you start 3D modeling based on the different views. And those 3D modeling uh, processes, we wanted to automate them as much as possible. So you're using anything ranging from uh, procedural modeling tools all the way into animation tools in order to create a three-dimensional uh, expression of that image. So what is interesting to me about that process is that you're almost, uh, you know, you're using a computational process to generate the concept rather than generate the final product, which is usually what uh, a lot of the parametric systems are being used for. They're used to rationalize a sketch, right? The human still makes the sketch either by hand or by some kind of intuitive 3D modeling process. And then eventually what ends up happening at the end is that you have to use computational tools to so-called rationalize them. But this process, I think the fact that it reverses that and allows you to creatively collaborate with a computational system uh, in the beginning of the process is, is, is a game changer. Um, so from that uh, you know, starting point, you end up generating results that actually um, um, have, that you wouldn't be able to do just if you were to do it on your own. So I do believe that it enhances the creative process uh, and it allows you to find se a set of novel approaches uh, so looking at that, like we, so starting with a purely stylistic formal approach, uh, then what we moved on to was to uh, actually think about the political implications of this approach. Uh, because a lot of the algorithms that we're using, even the style transfer algorithm and many of the GANs, uh, they're basically uh, outputs of uh, immense amount of research uh, in the fields of uh, image recognition, object recognition, surveillance. Uh, you know, and they, and the reason why we see so many examples of faces in a lot of these uh, GAN-based uh, 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 research is because they're primarily used, let's face it, for facial recognition. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the kind of political implications of that facial recognition system is, is obviously uh, immense, and it requires a much larger public debate. And, uh, and, by, and our intention was that how do we engage in that process uh, without enhancing it? Actually, how do we uh, you know, misuse the tool to such a point that it actually starts exploiting its origins and it starts to uh, create a context where it is no longer a political tool of control, but in fact, it is, it is a tool for exploration and artistic expression. So from that moment onward, you know, we started generating uh, through Google, um, um, Google Earth Studio, which is a kind of a higher end version of regular Google Earth that allows you to get a more realistic and high end uh, video footage uh, from uh, a select set of cities that are uh, 3D modeled in a more detailed way in the world. So in the workshop, we asked the students to pick a location that is, uh, that is detailed um, uh, in a more detailed way uh, in, in, in Google Earth Studio and generate a realistic looking uh, drone footage of a particular building. And from that moment, uh, they would use uh, compositing techniques uh, such as masking uh, in video editing tools in order to isolate uh, the envelope of that building so that uh, the style transfer process would only affect uh, that particular building envelope. And then they would curate a series of images that they believe are aesthetically relevant. And, uh, and also timely, and this is somehow influential in the zeitgeist. And then afterwards, uh, they would basically uh, create a video that will semantically reproduce some of the architectural qualities on the envelope, meanwhile regulating the amount of style that influences that envelope. So again, uh, that's where we kind of stop things in the sense that we only generated the, 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 the problem of the envelope as a sketch, and we didn't have the time uh, or the interest, to be honest, to uh, pitch the problem to students as a, as a further procedural modeling and 3D modeling exercise. 
uh, but just to keep things in a way in that level of ephemeral uh, expression uh, that uh, eventually yields to something in the kind of the expertly hand of a, of a digital architect. And, um, and the kind of results that you get are very similar to these in the sense that they're like purely operating in the world of a style transfer and they take an existing 3D uh, expression and really uh, uh, kind of transform that envelope into something much more expressive and much more different than uh, the, the initial uh, expression. But if you look at like uh, some of the pieces in detail, you see that the architectural scale is still there. And that is something that I find really fascinating about these systems is that is it, it has an ability to um, recognize and enforce certain parameters that uh, we wouldn't be able to do if we were just like freestyling. If you're, uh, let, the, the process of let's say fenestration and cutting uh, openings in the building is, is almost like a kind of an independent process from the, from the pattern of the facade, right? But in this process, they're somehow fused. They are working in conjunction with each other and they're working in tandem. And I think that was one of the more interesting conversations that we had uh, with the students in the workshop in the sense that they were quite fascinated by the synthesis of style with architectural expression uh, that in a way manifests so much, so e much so in the beginning of the process that you're almost like kind of reverse engineering the entire uh, architectural digital workflow in order to um, um, achieve what your initial sketch uh, has achieved, right? Um, so in that regard, I almost find the process to be more similar to an office like Frank Gehry's office, uh, rather than let's say a kind of a more digitally uh, I would say ambitious office uh, because what we are doing is that the concept uh, and the and the and the stylistic idea of the concept is is, is in a way coming first and you're in a way you employing afterwards 3D modeling tools to achieve that concept. But what is different about the concept and the generation of the concept is that you're collaborating with an algorithm to to in a way achieve that uh, objective. So these are some of the more, I would say, detailed examples of, of, of how that style transfer uh, paradigm is working in a building envelope system. And it, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of kooky, right? It's, 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 it's very, I would say, depending on the images that you pick, it's very colorful. There's a certain kind of like three dimensionality that is enforced by the image, uh, but it somehow respects the, the, the overall uh, massing, which is again this kind of parameter between what you consider to be an urban uh, expression of the building versus the architectural expression. And I think in that regard, the style transfer process is much more conducive towards uh, architectural expression rather than having the ability to process much larger uh, parameters relating to urban data. Uh, I would say that you would almost have to employ a separate system uh, in order to do that or employ the same system in a separate scale, right? So uh, based on that idea, you know, obviously we have done uh, quite a lot of work at UCLA to look at the two-dimensional flatness of an, of an urban planning exercise and how that could enforce a certain uh, type of new uh, emergent uh, urbanism that could in a way inspire to develop a much more informed level of urbanism. Uh, and then uh, through that process, uh, you know, we uh, also looked at the kind of the vis-a-vis -vis relationship between realistic depiction of, um, of, of, of an image versus design, right? Because design at the end of the day is, is always relying on a set of abstractions, but the jump that you can make through uh, GANs going from design into a kind of a representational expression that is that is almost a photography like is a, is a very interesting and unprecedented jump. And I think it brings up very, very uh, crucial questions about architectural representation or the goals of architectural representation and, uh, and what they mean 
uh, in terms of uh, culture of images, in terms of production of images, right? So, you know, in that regard, we, we in a way, uh, as an extension of, 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 of the kind of workflow that we did in um, the workshop and then uh, building up on that in the studio, what we have done is actually uh, interpreting uh, the images that the GAN produces in a, in a much more dumb and direct way and giving urban uh, parameters and qualities to these images and almost taking the images as face value and interpreting and imagining scenarios based on the image rather than producing an image based on the scenario. So this kind of like reversal of role again, I think allows you to uh, be inspired by the culture of production of images. And, uh, and rather than uh, taking the image as an expression of an idea, mining for ideas in the image and, uh, and giving values to that uh, process. So a further development of that yielded to these uh, set of results uh, at, uh, at UCLA at the end of this year, which where we uh, used a combination of series of different uh, machine learning uh, techniques, uh, ranging from three different types of GANs to uh, style transfer. Maybe. And uh, okay. hello? Okay. And what all of these are doing is in a way uh, establishing the relationship between scenario. And in this case, it was a kind of a, a post anthropogenic scenario about uh, different parts of the world and what kind of new urbanisms will emerge uh, as a consequence of uh, anthropogenic climate change. And that was a loose you know, ambition uh, in order to use all these different kinds of uh, machine learning tools, not only as uh, creative explorations, but also as analytical tools, right? Looking at how uh, land use is gonna transform, uh, using machine learning tools to interpret that transformation, uh, using style transfer to interpret and project into a future type of architectural expression, and then combining both of those uh, systems uh, as, a, as a kind of a template, as a starting point, and then using them to uh, generate a, a kind of a cinematic expression of those set of ideas uh, that uh, fit with the, with the generation of the scenario, which is a highly culturally analytical uh, objective, right? So, Kaved, just one yeah. thing. I think uh, we've got to be careful about the timing. Do, do you have okay. any actual images from the workshop itself? You said you hadn't hadn't got. Um, I don't actually, not in this presentation. Is there a but, video that's going to, that's on online? I haven't had a chance to check. Yes, video. there's a bunch of them. Let me stop sharing and then I will find one and I will show one. Um, let me see. And I'm also done. So that was the last slide. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, then, um, we could, why don't we, while you're looking for it, come back later on and, and sure. uh, take a look. okay. Um, yeah, I just, we need to get through everyone. Otherwise mm -hmm. we're going to run out of time. Um, I, maybe I should go through uh, alphabetically on my screen here. How Sheng is uh, the next step alphabetically? Uh, how is in, um, in the University of Pennsylvania doing a PhD? How, how Sheng, can you, um, mm -hmm. are you unmuted? Yeah, could you hear me? Yes, great, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so I think, uh, so my workshop is mainly about, uh, also mainly about style transfer. So maybe let me show my screen. Uh, yeah, the final outcome is a uh, is a five minutes video. So I think we so we can keep it uh, keep it below five minutes. Um, so in this workshop, I uh, mainly introduce the workflow of the style transfer from two D to three D to the to the students. So for example here. Um, yeah, for example here. So uh, regarding a 3D model, we can slice it into different uh, uh, plans. Uh, uh, well, the black means the inside area and the white means the outside area. Then we can choose a style, style, uh, style image. Then we could have stylized the plan. Then we can transfer it into a workflow-based uh, modeling or, or vector-based modeling. So I introduced this, this, this workshop to students and then the students can choose their own topic to develop this tool either to use it as a, as a 2D image or, or 3D workshops. Uh, so in this video, I saw some, uh, some, some student works using this 
uh, methodology. For example, they can regard this as a, a plan of the building, then they can use style transfer to get the plan, uh, the plan section of the of the building, then they can uh, they can build they can build the model. Also, they can regard this as the as the uh, 2D, 2D inspiration for their building. Then they can use this as the texture for their for their for, uh, for, for their facade. Uh, also, this is a pure. Uh, this is uh, this is just a 2D uh, 2D 2D application, which uh, the the student regards it as a pet as a painting. And also they could uh, they could think about how is the style uh, if the building have, if the building is on mass. So this is a, this is another sort of works. Um, also um, so there are some uh, there are some also architectural works for example they can regard it as architectural space then then uh, transform these uh, curves into walls. And also uh, for some topics about the uh, product design, so this is a product of the of regarding the shape of a car. Um, and this seems to be a historical research. For example, what is the uh, looking of the of a, of the of of the temple if it's style transferred? Now, also uh, students use the style transfer to uh, to generate architectural plans, the the the, histor the historical plan if if it's designed by another architect rather than the, the, the original architect. Uh, also, this is about the uh, style lines of the city. Uh, also, the stylization of the uh, window, uh, combining the Chinese window and the Western window. Um, uh, also, some like modeling. Um, yeah, this model is, seems like a very, uh, very fascinating model. Uh, also, this is research about the uh, uh, historical architecture in China. So we can use style transfer to stylize a tower in China. Uh, also, this is about the color of a city. Um, yeah. And some other works, for example, uh, how to transform a uh, style, style of the Chinese painting to a building. Uh, also, this is the stylization of another 3D model. Yeah, this is another showcase. So they transfer, for example, the natural pattern into a solid model to produce some uh, 3D pattern. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, regarding, this is about wider space using style transfer, for example, to transfer the landscape into a stylized uh, model. And this is a, another topic about the historical research about a bridge so 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 it talks about if if the bridge is designed by if if the bridge is designed by another architect for example uh the uh part the Pradios bridge the what what will it look like so this is about to mapping the style of the of the Pradio into an existing bridge uh, also, some other works uh, talks about the general machine, uh, general style transfer to some uh, architectural patterns and uh, some architectural modeling. So they don't have videos, but they have boats, uh, boats and pictures showing the results. Um, yeah, so I think it's more, uh, it's very similar to the previous introduced workshop by uh, Otto uh, Macias. Um, but my workshop is more open for the topic, so the so the student can can choose their own topic um, uh, with the uh, script and the computing power from Google Collab. So it's more uh, flexible for the for the student to 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 think about their own idea and their own usage of style transfer to their own design topic. Yeah, uh, maybe just let me show this video. Yeah, it's just still ten minutes. And some students also regard the yeah very simple like a building facade or the yeah. So this is this is a video. Um, finally, we also generate a book of the of the student works. So I quick go very quick through it. So firstly, I introduce the method methodology. The each student so their works. So this is the final all kind of a uh, book and uh, video here. Yeah. So. Neil, I'm done.
So uh, just yeah. uh, that it was a huge variety of work there. Um, congratulations, a lot of work produced. Uh, just one question: I mean, you, what, you, your um, workshop was in Chinese or English? Uh, actually, uh, I enrolled all the students who can speak Chinese, so it's in Chinese. But I asked them to produce their result in Chinese or English. So right. okay. Yeah. Well, um, I think there's a there's a discussion to be had between uh, about the, the way in which AI has been treated in, in, in China and how it's been treated in the West. Um, uh, but that was certainly very kind of very informative. Um, let's um, let's move on. Let's keep the questions for the end. Um, I Kai Hu is the next one I can see on the list. Um, Kai, I don't know if you were in, are you in Vienna or are you in um, uh, in, in L.A.? I'm in Vienna right now. You're in Vienna, okay. Yeah. So, so I should say, Kai, who is teaching at Angavante, uh, you're a, a graduate of SIAP, right? Yes. Yes. And uh, and in, in originally in China, where did you study? I was studying like business before. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, are you ready to present? Yes. Let me share my screen. Um... So um, the workshop um, I co-taught with Maya, Osler, um, also one of my colleagues at Yangvante, is named as Robotic Workspace. And in the workshop, we kind of constructed the workshop in both a theoretical background for us to re rethink about robotics in an architectural scenario in a more conceptual way, as well as going towards a more instrumental production of project. So at the beginning, like our students, they were investigating into um, kind of five main topics. One is what is robot? And the second one is path planning and movement pattern, how, um, how the AI is being utilized in path planning. And then we look at simulation and several different types of robots. And at the end, um, we produced a simulation in an office uh, work in a workspace scenario and look closely to the human robot interaction. So in terms of the robot, we are not using um, like a humanoid robot or robot arm. We are looking at, and we're trying to rethink about what is the robotic system? What is the fundamental of robots? So we did um, look at how robot would sense the environment, how the action would work, how the effectors and actuators work, and how does the autonomous, uh, the autonomous system of robots would work. And then we are trying to translate this sort of robotic system with um, building elements. So we actually went back to the beginning uh, when the first kind of a mobile robot, which is called um, Turtle Robot, was being developed in 19, I think 1943. And which is interesting because it's, almost the same as what we have for the cleaning robot like Roomba right now, that it's, move, it's moving on the wheel. It, can, it has a 360 rotation camera on the top, and then it's also trying to um, avoid the obstacles, as well as the, the, I would say the later generation, the robot developed in Stanford. And we also, we then try to look at the recent um, development of robot when we have the crowd um, robot and how this kind of crowd robot would work together. So this is a video from, I think from Harvard Robotic Lab. And to think about once we have like a thousand robots, how they, how they can work together and what is the way for them to recognize each other? How does the uh, SLAM system would work? How they, how they would sense the environment and um, develop a more um, cohesive way of working and how does this in, um, influence the way we think about architecture and space so in I think in one of the exhibition developed by um, Ernst Fisher this one is in Jeffrey Deitch in Los Angeles um, the robot is transformed into office chairs that they have their own logic and then they also kind of interact with um, the visitors. I think this is a way for us to rethink about robots and robotic technologies that they are not just 
another individual piece or like a humanoid robot anymore, they can be integrated in another level. So in terms of the theory, um, we, look, we look closely at the SLAM, um, simultaneous localization and mapping, path planning, locomotion and movement pattern. So the students, they were taught to understand how, um, how the physical mockup of the robot would work with its camera, as well as in the digital space, how this information is, how the physical information is being translated into the digital um, information. So I think in this case, the autonomous vehicle is a pretty mature um, technology to look at. Um, in this case, how the LIDAR is being used as a, as, a, as a way to sense the environment, how many cameras it has, how the, how the pixels are being recognized and then translated into voxels and then how they construct into the environment and how the object detection use the voxel information to um, tell the vehicle what those things are and how, the, how to avoid stuff and recognize pedestrians. So um, we look very closely at the map representation because, because this is an AI workshop. And then we want to focus the more like the technical aspect into, uh, into the path planning. So the students, they were introduced um, to two different kinds of map. One is the discrete approximation and the other one is the continuous approximation. So the discrete is like how the Roomba would recognize the space by doing like a um, parallel movement or going through like different um, uh, squares one by one. Um, and then we try to compare how these different behaviors would influence the way to recognize in the environment. And then the continuous approximation is more utilized right now, more, more utilized into like this kind of terrace and outdoor environment. And um, also the uh, autonomous vehicle is another um, good example for, for the continuous approximation. And as well as the robots that are being utilized on Mars or Moon. So, um, so in this case, the way they capture the environment is is going to be completely different because they have to build up a more um, com a more comprehensive uh, physical world in their mind, and then different how different um, how different information or representation is going to construct the world differently. So. Um, also algorithms, we, in, the, in the workshop, we use the, the A star algorithm and then and also the um, D star algorithm to script the robot in different way. I'm just gonna skip this. So, um, so at the end, the students are asked to produce simulation uh, with the Unity toolkit we developed um, in the past two years at UCLA Ideas and then at Angavante. Um, along with Greg Lin and other uh, colleagues of mine, including uh, Marta and Marta Nowak and also Bensa and Maya. So um, simulation has already been used in, in both um, small robots as well as architecture uh, technology, um, like for escape, and then the, and then also to look at the building codes. So we look at how um, simulation is being used for both pedestrians as well as for robots. Maybe I should just go to the work we produced. So before that, the students they they are asked to. Um, do a little bit research on four different types of robots. The Amazon Kiva robot, uh, which move in a very perpendicular way. And the Starship, which is kind of moving out outdoor. And Jita, which follows people. And then the Nightscope. Um, and also the Spot from Boston Dynamics. So, um, 
So in the first assignment, I think the students are trying to uh, investigate um, the relationship of the movement of robot and then also the movement of the people, like on the one surface, how you can kind of define their um, movement area or design or de um, define their kind of spatial relationship by scripting them in two different logics or assigning two different maps for them. Um, so in those simulations, you will see that the, um, these kind of capsules are representing people and then the smaller pieces are representing robots. Like in this case, you will see the robots, they are moving, either moving in a small cell or they are moving outdoor. And then the people, they can come, kind of come in and out through those small doors. Like these are like abstract models for students to, to have a general idea of um, the simulation of two different agents and then start to develop um, a relationship of those two different agents in an architectural space. So these were all produced by the students in the first, I would say the first two days. Um, think about the moving obstacle, the dynamic environment, and once we have more kind of factors influencing the movement or having different kind of vectors in the space, how it would look like uh, in a real time. So in this one, you see um, some students were experimenting with three different kinds of agents and then to kind of see their behavior. So, um, so they were using both um, the nav mesh component in Unity, which is um, kind of based on the A-star path planning algorithm, as well as the customized behavior design tool, which they set up certain logics for the people. Let's say um, the, the pedestrian, they, they have half of the chance to go left and half the chance to go right, or they have 30% of the chance to visit the first spot and then 30% of the chance to visit the second spot in order to have a kind of non-animated non, um, and more realistic scenario in the simulation. And then slowly we move to um, an office environment, which they first try to, try to kind of investigate um, a certain um, kind of traditional workspace and see how the robotic systems can be implemented and how these sort of two systems can work and how certain um, specific concepts can be developed, such as geofencing or have certain courtyard for the robot um, or have this kind of a specific area for robots to move, but the people can move to everywhere and, and then to observe the rules and the behavior of these two different agents. And then um, the way to rethink about um, the opening and closing, to rethink about the doors, to rethink about walls, and then to develop a more dynamic scenario that is utilizing the principles of robotics into architectural elements. And at the end, they kind of did their own proposal for, for a office, um, for a workspace scenario, and then try to kind of propose a new typology for, for office space. So this one is what's happening kind of uh, in, in the underground floor that the robots, they are moving in a certain path. Um, and then sometimes they also been elevated um, to create more convenience for the movement and sometimes they kind of interact together and on the upper floor are the people and then here you see how the robots they are coming up to serve the people and then how the people are coming to work how they move um, to have a more to use this kind of work scenario as a more realistic uh, model for the simulation to really rethink about how this can be integrated in a deeper level so we had a great pleasure working with our students at the, at the Digital Futures. I think, I think this kind of format 
work perfectly for for this kind of subject. And I, we also want to say we really appreciate um, uh, Neil and, and other people who organize the event. It's such a nice way to kind of work with other other students and other profession, um, professions um, together in a short amount of time to de develop something cross um, disciplinary. So this is the last slide, I think. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Well, I mean, can I say, first of all, thank you to you and all the other workshop instructors, because without your incredibly generous contribution, this thing couldn't have happened. And uh, um, it really was a fantastic uh, kind of spirit of solidarity, everyone coming together to go and do that. Um, that was great. I mean, I got some questions. I, I mean, can I ask you quickly, does, d apart from walls moving, can the walls deform in response to the, to the robots or it, they can just simply move, right? Yeah, sometimes they can be responsive. Um, like you send out a signal if you move, like you are like two meters away from the wall and the wall would open. So it provides a lot of opportunities for simulation. Okay, great. That, that, there's a lot to talk about there. Let's move on. We've got, we've got three more presentations. Um, Emmanuel, my apologies. I should have asked you to come in earlier. Um, Emmanuel was the first person to log on this the, today. Um, uh, and he is in Singapore. So uh, um, it's late. It's about 11 o'clock at night for him. Uh, Emmanuel, could, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Fantastic. I'll show my screen then. Okay. Yes, um, so I want to actually talk about style transfer. <laughs> I was doing some uh, style transfer back in 2016. Uh, I think if, if Neil remember at the Shanghai Visiting School, A Visiting School. But anyway, so um, here's a screenshot of the workshop page, uh, in case those who don't know uh, what it is about. Um, so you could look at the details, but I think it's uh, just kind of the structure of the workshop uh, is actually quite short, uh, 20 hours in total. Uh, five days. I've got uh, about 20 plus plus students, uh, really nice. Uh, so the first half of the week, uh, we basically spend time understanding the, the theory of something, which is something I've been developing, and also the, the uh, structure and the design of the GANs, uh, General Adversary Networks, uh, in, in this case via lectures and, and coding tutorials. Uh, in, in, in this case, we're using PyTorch uh, with the command line and, and yeah, directly. Uh, then the, the other half of the week was spent on basically doing the design projects. Um, so uh, I'll just go, go quicker. Yes, so the, the, the title of the workshop is actually taken directly from uh, an AD article that I wrote uh, from the, the discrete um, issue uh, edited by, uh, by Jills. Um, so the, the workshop discourse is actually underpinned by my theory of architecture sampling. Um, which I mentioned just now, but also in, but in particular in this workshop through the lens of deep learning and the discrete. Um, just kind of have a context uh, before I go into the actual uh, workshop output. Uh, so in, in this case, there's this moment in history, the super studio histogram of architecture, which I think is really interesting. Uh, some of the things that I, I quoted from, from them, uh, this idea where design could be reduced uh, as a kind of a generalizing process and then also where there is no, there is this idea where the histogram is this catalog that could generate effortlessly, uh, effortlessly um, to a multitude or infinite number of, uh, um, of forms. And interestingly enough, we've talked about the depth of the architect and the histogram actually <laughs> implied that also. Um, so, so three things uh, to take away from this example is the generalizing process, the generative models, and the statistics on probability as the new architect. Um, instead of a very limited uh, catalog, like Super Studio Histogram of Architecture, uh, what if it is an unlimited data set? Like my, in, in this case, this uh, new thing that I'm working on, which is related to the, the, the uh, workshop, um, in, fact, in fact, the simplified version of the code, I, I actually use it for the workshop. This is the histogram of architecture. In this case, uh, uh, um, again, uh, CNN, that directly takes in 3D uh, voxel model, uh, of course, in the language of the histogram, uh, this idea of a strongly and weakly sampled from. So on, on the left side, you see a much well-trained uh, GAN uh, 3D. But on the right side, there are moments of uh, uh, 
is actually suffering from mode collapse. Uh, for those who are familiar, it means that the learning model is uh, unable to generate greater variety of forms, and therefore it could be understood as a weak, uh, weakly sampled forms. And if we look deeper into the probability distribution of every single voxel, where in this case a, a dark, a darker voxel represents a stronger and a voxel that has a higher probability of existing in, in physical space, um, we could, in other words, we could say that this we could say that the the, the color represent the hallucination, the propensity of a voxel. This is is um, ability to 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 be uh, to be present. So on the right. You could see that um, the the distribution is, is much more kind of a gradient of colors because it's not very confident of its own existence. Um, so in this case, uh, these are actually building models. So at the same time, we can also look at semantic arithmetic operations. So if we understand the latent space, you could say, for instance, looking at you guys are probably familiar with this idea of a smiling woman minus a woman, you get a smile and then a smile plus a man, you get a smiling uh, face of a man. So likewise, you can do the same kind of operation to, to control the 3D uh, uh, form of the uh, uh, of the generated objects, in this case, uh, high-rise uh, public housing building. So now back to the actual workshop outputs, uh, we will actually see more chairs uh, than buildings uh, simply because of the uh, data sets is uh, readily uh, available. Partly because I think it's, uh, it's a good example also for, for newbies. Uh, many of my students, they're they are, they are not very familiar with deep learning at all. Uh, I think it's a, a kind of a good start. And also uh, partly because of the super studio, like the super studio histogram, the work is more about the generalization of forms rather than whether is it really a building, a furniture or objects. In fact, later on, you'll see how some of the groups try to overcome this ontological uh, assume a priori uh, restriction. This is actually a, a video. Um, I think it's just two minutes um, for those who have not seen it. Uh, so in this case, yeah, I, I'll just run it. Uh, so we don't have to be stuck to the voxel, right? So basically a voxel is just a placeholder. We could include discrete uh, components within them. Um, in, in this case, one of the group was looking at the COVID-19. Um, I, I think it's quite sad. Anyway, I just leave it uh, to run now. So the idea of uh, this, we could think about the combination of furniture typology as a combination of building typology as well. But in this case, a very simple toy exercise. Um, here we uh, is showing the training process uh, for particular furniture, in this case, the, the bed and also the chair. And then you could actually train them together so that they have the same latent space. And then this idea of um, interpolation between different chairs. In this case, it's not actually, actually very well trained. Um, but again, this is a nice weak form of uh, some sample. Um, so if we replace the voxel also, we could look at more smoother continuous representation like this one, for instance. Um, and at the same time, students were looking at the possibility. So given an object that is generated by the machine, and oftentimes it's not structurally functional, what if the human does the auto-completion process? Um, that's why you see these thread looking thing. Uh, it's actually added by the, by the student. Uh, just a quick training course that is seen a bit. The select so students were asked to train uh, actually on their laptop when we we weren't using Google Lab. Uh, we actually spent half a day to just install every single thing on what is it Ubuntu or Windows or Mac. I just I thought it's nice that the student could run it on their own laptop. Um, and then they were asked to train their own own thing, right? Ch choose any furniture objects and then have a sense of how it looks like. Um, so 
in some students look at the, again, the, the voxel is a placeholder. So in this case, the student use the um, certain architecture module instead. Um, this is a combination of this uh, discrete aggregation using the chair in this case as kind of an invisible massing that, uh, that kind of um, inform where the aggregation should happen. So we're trying to kind of make sense of the probability distribution. I think this is probably the, I'm gonna check this towards the end of the video. Yeah, I think I can move on. Um, so the, the first exercise was to use this chair, as I mentioned. So this, these are the student works. Uh, uh, I think the student from India in this case, um, just kind of playing around uh, different uh, different models that they choose. Uh, some students are kind of using more, I suppose, more platonic solids to, to do the aggregation. Um, and um, students will also think about how that might be part of the actual uh, fabrication process um, in the robotic assemblies, so in this case, for instance, if it's made of timber parts or clay um, blobs, how m might that work out? Um, and this other team looked at the generation of an entire warehouse of furniture, so may maybe another vitra. Um, like in this case, uh, the interior view of this imaginary uh, showroom. Um, um, some and some some of the parts, uh, some of the furniture is actually half bed and half um, sofa. I think uh, this is linked to the the that student project that did this uh, COVID nineteen thing. Um, the coal furniture is uh, the, the one I spoke about where the, the human does the completion, the filling in of the blanks, the, the, the gaps, um, which I suppose is interesting that it creates its own human variation on top of the machine variation. Um, the, some students use the Japanese genre as the, as the, uh, the replace the voxel, for instance. Uh, some uh, render, um, and also, if we think about this, uh, again, uh, this group looked at uh, the metaphorical approach, meaning uh, when you look at the MAD absolute tower, sometimes uh, people are thinking about uh, Marilyn Moron. So this idea where we could use uh, other forms as a proxy uh, to create architecture uh, building uh, assembly. Uh, some examples of the different massing spatial units. Uh, in this case, uh, maybe more laid out explicitly. Um, at the bottom right, you see this uh, arithmetic going on. So it's like the smiling woman minus a woman operation. But in this case, we are trying to play as much as we can, including multiplication and uh, other high dimensional uh, operations. And in this case, they also use it as a proxy for uh, an architectural structure. Uh, again, replacing with uh, different uh, modules. Um, so in this case, for instance, uh, given a specific probability, they would become uh, platforms. Uh, those with higher probability would be given the role of uh, vertical uh, structures. Yes, so uh, pretty pretty fast uh, presentation. I, I'm I'm done with the presentation. Yeah. That was um, uh, 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 quite a uh, quite a range of, of material there. Uh, actually, one of my I should say one of my former students, Jorge uh, Tubella, was 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 on that was on that group, and he, he certainly enjoyed the workshop. So, uh, thanks, Emmanuel. That's great. We've got two more presentations. I think it's just two more to go. Uh, um, so maybe we 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 can move on. Uh, uh, Shiki, 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 do I pronounce that properly? I'm sorry. Um, who is in, in Beijing? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can't hear you very well, so maybe could you speak quite loud? Right. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Shiki, okay. you are very quiet. It's almost, we can't hear you. Um, can, Can you come that? closer to the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Mm. 
reading is okay too. Yeah, you you got your microphone off. <clears throat> um, so we're not we're not hearing you at the moment. I'm just trying to see if I can. You can I can unmute him. Okay, now. Okay. She... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Now, now we can. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. We, we start. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we, we did this workshop called um, uh, Playground, and uh, uh, myself, Shi Qi Li, um, and uh, Kai Yang, and uh, Yi Jun Huang, uh, he's in um, uh, London right now. Um, oh, uh, we, we're from CAFA, the Central Academy of Fine Arts. Um, it's uh, a um, uh, art and a design school. Uh, it's uh, one of the most famous uh, I would say the best uh, fine art and design school in China, and we teaching here. Uh, we 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 have a, a we just uh, uh, got a new program called system design. Um, uh, this oh. is a very interesting, uh, very interesting school, and uh, I hope uh, I just uh, introduce this place to uh, all of you guys. You know, you, you, if you are interested. Um, to do uh, workshops or some talks in the school, you know, uh, we are more than welcome. Uh, uh, they're asking you guys to, to, to join. Um, okay, for, for system design, this new program, we focus on a, to, uh, our design approach, uh, explores ways of cultivating interrelated design agendas to flourish. Um, uh, uh, holistic, um, uh, holistic complexes. Um, so uh, recent years we focus on, um, of course, we, 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 we do parametric design, we do uh, digital fabrication, and mainly we, we right now we focus on uh, how to apply, apply uh, AI uh, technology uh, in the design domain. Um, the workshop called um, a, um, Playground. So basically, it's, it's not a very conventional uh, style of workshop. We, uh, we just uh, uh, did it a uh, uh, very experimental way. And uh, the, the, the really the, the keywords could be, you know, how to use, how to use this uh, social network as a kind of a vehicle to collect the data from the um, people and also as a, a kind of a communication um, tools to uh, really interrelate with um, 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 urban or uh, with design, uh, things like that. Uh, I think uh, later on, uh, Yijun would uh, uh, to explain that more. Um, basically in the, uh, for, for this workshop, we, 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 we did it in two parts. Uh, the one part is just uh, for to to teach to encourage um, students to to use the, um, uh, the the to to use the idea the bottom up um, uh, process to um, to use the um, uh, social network to to ex explore really uh, something interesting. Um, uh, and the second part is to, for us, we build up a kind of uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, work with a computing uh, scientist, we build up a kind of uh, um, hardcore code as an infrastructure to explore something interesting. Um, we can talk that more later. Um, so, um, uh, in the beginning, we just show kind of um, uh, artwork from the um, pioneers. Um, uh, artist. Uh, so this is this is one uh, uh, art movement called uh, Happenings. So, uh, basically, this uh, the uh, Alan uh, Capro uh, did it in uh, 1950 or uh, 60s. Um, basically, the artist uh, doing their work uh, in their studio, and once they finish that, they present their works in the gallery. Um, and, Alan just uh, um, did something totally new. Um, he, he did his work in, in the gallery and showed all the process uh, with, with the um, people who visit the gallery and to sometimes to in, 
uh, interact with, with with those people. So this is the totally new understanding of uh, of doing art. Um, I, I we we find it quite quite interesting because um, uh, the the um, uh, people really can engage uh, into the uh, um, the artwork and form a very important part of the the, the art piece. And also um, this one called Happening. Uh, this 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 the uh, Tanya did uh, um, the the um, uh, the public art in the uh, Turban Hall in Tate. Um, also, uh, she just invite a lot of people and finish this the, this artwork all together. I, 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 okay, due to the time is uh, the limitation. I, I wouldn't explain that too much. Um, and also for this one, uh, it's, uh, I think this uh, um, co um, uh, very interesting work as well. Um, this um, um, uh, Thai uh, uh, this artist just uh, create the, the uh, Thai food, place that onto the table. Um, uh, here, the food is not an art, but uh, is the art, but not in the uh, fun cuisine sense. Um, it's not what you see uh, that is important, um, but what take place between people are very important. You, you guys can imagine, you know, you place this uh, um, uh, insanely long table with full of food in the uh, art gallery and you invite the people to, to come to visit, to, to see the uh, art piece and uh, they, they grab food and uh, the, the whole thing is just uh, totally get changed. That I think this is a very interesting way to, um, to understand uh, um, uh, how, peop uh, how artists are doing the art. Um, and this one also interesting, it is called 6 p.m. Um, the artist only plays a piece of carpet uh, in the gallery and also give a, a place a table and the chairs. So give a hint that as if on the wall, there is a, a window and the, the cast the, 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 the shadow, sh shadow on the ground. And you, you have to carefully, you know, to um, understand the space and honest uh, to, to, to see it, be sensitive to see um, the artwork. So it's, uh, then it, it start making sense. This, this is also very interesting clue to us, you know, uh, uh, for how we create something interesting. Um, and also we look at the uh, Conway's Game of Life. Oh, okay, for, for this part, I, I think, uh, Huang, you, you, you can okay. jump in. Okay, hello, hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hi. Hi, basically, uh, I think for us, what, what makes us feel really interested uh, in the realm of AI is, uh, uh, we, so we start looking at the cellular uh, automata and uh, we, we, what we interest us is the, the man versus machine. And um, because, uh, for for example, this uh, next page can can we go for next page? City. Next page. Hello. Huang. Yeah. Huang. Can you go for yeah, next probably, page? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I switch off. Probably you share the screen. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. right, okay. I switch off. Right. Sorry. Okay. Right. Due to the uh, the the delay of the internet. Yeah, so. Yeah, probably. That's the okay. Better. Right. Uh, let me share my screen. In. Uh, one second. Hi. Uh, can you hear? Me? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. So what what, what interests us is actually the difference of these. We start from these two. So one is the game of life. One is the we feel is sort of next step or different, a counterpart of between the man and machine. So uh, you, you can see this is, they're, they're both cellular, but they're both like grid. But one is uh, kind of, it, it start from very simple um, uh, uh, rules and um, it's, it's, it's a very uh, iconic 
um, very basic sample of, um, of, of, of a very complex system, but start from very simple rules. And the other is also very, very simple rules, but actually the, these circulars is not really being uh, controlled by a simple rules, but actually uh, being manipulated by the crowd, but actually by the people. So, uh, so these are the something which we, we think um, in, 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 the, in the realm of AI and also now it, the crowd intelligence has been also categorized as being part of AI. And also what, what, what our take on the, the artificial intelligence is, uh, in, in, maybe you guys have known a lot of like these examples, which those uh, um, meant to be self-driven cars driven by artificial intelligence, but actually controlled by the uh, by cheap labor from <laughs> and 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 were actually remote controlled, so we are actually looking at these these things uh, these notions. So um, and maybe there could be something um, we we utilize or we we can speculate these uh, the between in uh, if we start a infrastructure to get people to uh, to interact. In a social network, this is something for uh, for creative art. So that's that's what we were looking at. So, um, so we were sort of looking at those damn formation, which is a very huge thing in in, in social media um, in the social network in China. So uh, we, we we separate our groups. We have like thirty um, uh, about thirty students, and so we separate the student to four uh, seven groups. Um, so they they have uh, developed their own scenarios of um, this kind of social uh, infrastructure and to to for co-creating, and so this is the the, the first group, and they made this uh, interesting um, amazing maze, and uh, so basically it's kind of a it's it's, it's like a kind of game so. Um, basically, you can you some people will will, will build the walls, and some people would um, would uh, would use the the the, the um, to control the balls. And um, so they also bring this up to three dimensional. So I'll quickly go just go through it because there's seven different teams, seven different parts of work. So you can have a quick look. And this one is also very interesting. It's group two, which is that they call it attention, please. So, uh, it's, so it's, it's very interesting. Like uh, when, we ex when we post our images now, nowadays online or whatever um, pictures online, and, and it's very, uh, very interesting to see people's different parts, what, what, which part of the image people are interested in. So, they designed this uh, this uh, sort of co-creation sort of uh, um, uh, app could could be called app or we, we could co-creating tools, and so so say say for example someone post a image and they would uh, look at um, so so different different players different in um, participate would click on where, where parts they find more interesting, right? So then the, the part actually changes. And I ha actually have a video of that to show you. So you can see these are the peoples who actually interacting with, and they can be highlighted or, or, or blow up. So you could imagine this thing could be um, in a way of to how we look at these artworks or how we look at our buildings. And also this is uh, um, the, the, th the third group. Um, so they made up this sort of, this is more like a game and it's very, uh, I can also show a video of this.
So some people can build up the walls. Some people can take over. So it's like co-creating of, 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 of this maze, but also as a maze. But uh, these are these these player sort of these players. They are uh, robots. So so these are the robots which they try to get this way. And you can play as whether you can make it as an obstruction or you, you can make it to 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 get, go through. So basically, it's sort of a, a competitive game, uh, in this sense. So it's, it's so this could be. Um, I think many of you may remind you this is the a kind of the next version of the pong game. Uh, back in the 1995, uh, the, the famous one, which everybody shouts red and, 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 and played, uh, it's like a crowd played game. And also this uh, group, which was with, were working on the cat in the Forbidden City and trying to build a, uh, a sort of a, a hyper reality or, 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 of, of, of cat palace um, superimposed to the Forbidden City. And this this team was working on a, um, a, a another different uh, sort of app, which I can. It's quite long, but I can quickly go through. So, so it's basically they're dealing with different dream states, different dreams, and, and people can interactive with 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 their their dreams and probably can can see different people in in the different dreams so it's also a, a sort of like, kind of like a social uh, network tool but it's based on themes of a dream Okay, so and also, so this is the uh, the, uh, the the sixth team, which they they are working on uh, something called um, basically um, a, an also kind of like a new sort of avatar and and an emoji, but in 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 the sense of um, um, balloons. Uh, virtual blooms when you when you go go out there and when you um so so kind of like uh you if you go somewhere you will see your own expression of, of blooms and um and uh kind of you use this sort of as as interaction with, with each other and also we have uh the, the last team is also uh very interesting which is a kind of looking at back all the other teams was doing and they are the uh, which we call the trickster they basically they try to sabotage or they try to be the uh, the hacker of the system and try to um, spy on everyone and um, and try not to play with along with the rules so and so apart from so these are the so so we, we just introduced the, some of the student work we we and um, we, we we did together uh, during the workshop so also we we we, tr we are we are building up a sort of a, a infrastructure for uh, for a bigger project which is the uh, sort of uh, a social also the social dealing with the social network and um, we are working with uh, with with uh, nat nat natural lang language processing so um, we have uh, a uh, we, we we have a sort of uh, uh, um, questionnaire or not really question a sort of a mini game which will embedded it with uh, the the most popular um, uh, um, the most popular um, like like WhatsApp uh, the, the 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 chatting app and similar as WhatsApp it's called WeChat in China. So uh, we have this mini game in WeChat, and which you can uh, express your um, your your, your um, emotions. So and and so, so we we we're using the natural language processing to uh, 
to analyze what they say, and uh, we build we're building a a um, a database and to a dictionary to analyze these and to build a up a uh, emotion map for Beijing. So these are some uh, some some basic mockups that we are we are working on at the moment. So, uh, well, yeah, uh, I, I, I could add up a bit. Actually, this is the hard core of the game because um, for the um, natural language, uh, natural language uh, perception process is quite difficult, actually. So we um, ask our students to help us to build up kind of a dictionary um, so that it really give the score for um, everyday language um, in Chinese, um, like like the interface that uh, the 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 typing piece of uh, um, message say, and then the 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 the, the code can uh, give a score um, uh, to the emotion that they trying to um, um, to to express. I think this is quite quite difficult, and I I think. Uh, if the tool or the code get uh, developed, uh, it can really uh, do something amazing. It's, so basically, uh, to just to give the emotion um, kind of um, um, uh, score as a parameter, so that we can use that to do a lot of things. So this is the infrastructure that 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 we build, and we work with the um, uh, computer scientist uh, to develop develop a, a sort of um, um, advanced code for that. Yeah. Yeah. Huang, you, you, you can go on. Yeah. So uh, that's, that, that, that's, that's what we are in, in the moment. So I think uh, is we are very fascinated about the, the work the students produced during the, this very short um, workshop and uh, the, um, the sheer uh, variety of it and the, the amount of work they, they, they put in and uh, so I, I think that's that's mainly our focus on was the the actual because um, we, we 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 see a lot of like agent based modeling and also a, a lot of cellular uh, um, automata with 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 actual use computer to simulate and um, and we 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 at the moment we what we are interested in is actually to to utilize the human uh, as uh, as the the node. And I think that that uh, and and uh, to 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 work on the realm of art. Okay, great. we're we're done here. Yeah, great, fantastic. I mean, I the, the, I, I just uh, share your <clears throat> thoughts and the variety and the hard work, uh, variety of work and the the sheer amount of work that's been put into each of these work, these workshops. I, I wasn't just want to clarify. I wasn't quite sure how you're defining AI here. Is it what was the what were the the, were you using any deep learning techniques, or was it, was it just? Ah, yes. So, so we, we're not using deep learning here, but th this is a, a natural language processing. Yeah. So, um, so, so it's a part of AI. So, but also, crowd, uh, crowd also, also now the crowd intelligence has been categorized as AI as well. So yeah. the AI. So that's 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 very interesting. Uh, the notion of, about AI has been changed for the last, let's say, uh, forty years. And uh, before, it, it, like uh, I think most, a lot of like hardcore, uh, uh, old-fashioned AI uh, scientists, they wouldn't really like Alan Kay, and they, they, they wouldn't really categorize uh, machine learning as AI. But nowadays, it's different. We have a, a much broader understanding of AI. So crowd intelligence, like for example, well, so what uh, we are looking at the the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Which is uh, basically um, using um, using human power, mini miniature human powers, and also, then, for example, we 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 look at it with the students uh, on in, in, uh, about the, the 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 examples. For example, like a recapture is also using very very like mini miniature tasks, and without sometimes without even the the student actually uh, without the participant even notice. That you are actually participating, you are actually contributing in, into a, a a kind of uh, a, a bigger network or, or, or of intelligence. So the, the, these are the so the, now now these has been also been all categorized a uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, 
and that's that's actually what we we find even more interested um because like say um in the end maybe um because we, we are looking at a lot of like uh uh like for example, GAN and what, what GAN can create and a lot of uh, other groups of creating, which are fascinating work from other other instructors. What you will find very interesting is or, um, a lot of uh, style transfers and GANs. And, and um, we, we maybe in a, one day, um, let's say it's in, 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 in the future, maybe uh, artificial intelligence actually can take over. A lot of people were worried about can take over our jobs. But uh, maybe like human can, <laughs> but, but our take is probably like human men that may, may die, you know, mankind might perish. But uh, I mean, it's like architect, the best thing at least we can do is to, to, to build a design, a, a nice desk bed, you know, a, a, a comfortable and, and warm human kind one. And maybe for, for also as an architect for, for humankind, we can design a very elegant um, ending for the humankind. <laughs> so, so, the, the, <laughs> so th these are our thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Yeah, I should tell you that I, I'm doing a book that uh, two books on AI. One is about the positive side. Yeah. One is about the negative side. And the, the negative one is going to be called the death of the architect. But I'm just wondering whether, in fact, uh, if you Google death and architecture, whether yeah. ever you would get to my my book. There's so many. Anyway, whatever. Mm. That was interesting yeah. as a kind of comment. <laughs> let's uh, let's, yeah. let's yeah. move on finally to Wang Yu. I mean, I want to save some time at the end. For for, um, uh, for some discussion between you, but I, I, I just think this, this I would say at the moment this is a fascinating oversight of uh, of, of um, uh, what's what's been going on. It's it's um, uh, fabulous. So uh, just to say, um, when you uh, is I would um, yes. <clears throat> hi when you uh, we was also part of a discussion, a panel discussion, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting, um, and it's it's uh, about AI and the future. Uh, Paul Bart Hulkland, um, it's space maker AI, who was kind of like the rivals, big rivals of X School, came together. And what the nice thing was, first of all, is you didn't fight. <laughs> they kind of like almost like they, you, you were sort of sort, sort long lost brothers or something like that. <laughs> very, very interesting how you kind of the similarities that was going on. And in many ways, what we do today, bringing together everyone from around the world, it's kind of interesting how the kind of overlaps and things between the, the between different approaches. Uh, are being played out. Anyway, I'll say no more, but uh, when you uh, welcome. All right. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, uh, introduce a bit about what we did this year. Uh, can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Yeah, I will talk uh, uh, shortly um, in 10 minutes. Um, actually, we are uh, always uh, doing the uh, same topic in in digital future as the AI technology application possibilities in architecture as what we do uh, in X-School. Um, so in digital futures, we already involved for three years. The first three years uh, or first two years, we did a discrimination and evaluation. And this year we did a reconstruction. Uh, we can give a, a very short uh, um, uh, see back and see uh, in 2018 we using uh, discrimination um, to see what is the issues of the streets uh, for instance this one took Wall Street in Tokyo and analyzed the uh, urban uh, like a uh, activity and the passive uh, zones so this is a one usage of uh, AI in analyzing analyzing and the second year in 2019 uh, we get into the evaluation part. So we're using um, evaluation to predict and suggest uh, some um, streets issue. Uh, for instance, in this one, we're not only showing the or teaching the students to do the algorithm itself, but we also um, teach them how to do the model with the application. So uh, this is a app, uh, an app eventually. You can select the streets around the Tongji University or somewhere else in uh, Shanghai and uh, upload your model, what kind of uh, parameters you want to um, analyze for the streets. And then it will show you what is the issue on the, uh, on the uh, target streets. And for instance, what is the uh, green vision and what is the um, emptiness percentage and what were a lacking of a, a free space or open space, etc. So 
it could help us to uh, do analyzing as well. Uh, so this is uh, what we did for the last two years. Is we also see here uh, AI is mostly helping on evaluation uh, discrimination, this kind of uh, uh, quantitative uh, analyzing. This is a one first part of our research um, in digital future. And this year we get into um, reconstruction uh, those images we saw on the screen is what we did in uh, 17th April uh, 2019 uh, using uh, again to like reconstruct all different results of uh, modern villas, let's say. Uh, you can see AI shows us uh, a virus of possibilities from uh, possibility A to B to C. It shows the entire procedures just as, as very similar to what the human or architects thinking in their brand during their um, creation work process. And this kind of uh, image we can produce quite a lot with the, um, the, the GAN, um, yeah, you can see this is one of the procedures. Uh, but however, the issue is those things are just the images, it cannot use for the real design procedure. It is not uh, um, like uh, uh, what we used to use as the uh, drawings directors. There's, there's no uh, direct use you can like take from those images, except for uh, some idea inspirations. So what we're thinking maybe this year, it's good to teach the students how to transfer this idea to um, the real design. So uh, this is the one we did for last year's uh, uh, Shenzhen Biennale. So uh, you draw on the left side and then you get the results of the image on the right side. So you can have the um, interaction uh, with the, uh, the architects or the user and uh, uh, also using AI to generate things. Uh, maybe the, the people draw on the left side are just a kid but they, they can get uh, some proper results out from the uh, AI's generation. This is uh, uh, what we did for that. But this year we did for the digital future, we combining uh, what we as XCO did for our uh, general working and uh, some um, technologies like pixel to pix, a uh, pix to pix and TensorFlow with the uh, students. So we can, uh, using architect sketch for landscape, showing how to transfer this. Um, first of all, uh, we have to introduce them with TensorFlow, how to using uh, use the uh, linear uh, regression uh, to do the basic discriminations. Um, just the answer combination for last two years, this part is also been needed uh, to see what is the um, possibilities of uh, uh, architecture and the landscape. But this year we are more focusing on uh, the landscape with architecture. So the, there's the three types of input materials for this training. First is the Google Maps. You can see um, the satellite maps is just the real world representation. And second one is the normal style um, master plan. And third one is the hand drawings. So we input the three different styles uh, to train. You can see uh, the results of the uh, the, the uh, image uh, image recognition. Uh, it can like uh, define some of the elements out from those different types of uh, training data sets, and eventually we get to um, pix to pix, and uh, then uh, this is uh, what we get from the results. You can draw your zones uh, or anything you want, and it will generate a, a very fuzzy image. But uh, uh, the most important thing is transform this image into the 3D model. So there, here is a short video out from this. So uh, similar to what we did for the Biennale, um, you input a drawing and uh, a second then it generate a image out from it. But is it just like a sketch input? And uh, then you can have the results as 3D modeling. So in this way, uh, we can really interact the human inputs with the AI outcomes. 
So um, this, that is for this year. And uh, next, I don't know what we're going to do for next year, be honest, because uh, uh, one step further is what we do as X school. We are doing um, like a real, uh, real world design for the, for the uh, master plans, for the uh, units, et cetera. So we're also uh, thinking uh, there could be some more possibilities we are going to uh, search for. For instance, different typologies of uh, architectural design or different phases. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Neil. Well, thank you, Andy. That was fantastic. Um, so uh, we've now been through all the presentations. Uh, what I, I want to step back and let, the first of all, the discussion among you take place. But I also, we have um, uh, some of the committee members for the Digital Futures Young, uh, who are um, part of the Zoom presentation, uh, Zoom uh, discussion. And I want to invite people to, um, to, to, to ask questions. I, I think what I will say is, is that it's actually, I was kind of shocked in a way by the range of approaches. I kind of saw, I thought we were going to be a lot of this kind of GAN work, but actually it's opened up in many different sort of ways. And uh, I'm just glad that we did this event because otherwise I would never have been able to find out what was going on in, in each of those individual workshops. I think there's a fascinating array of different approaches and a huge amount of industry that's gone into that. So um, I, would, uh, I, I would like to, to invite, I don't know how we're going to do this, but um, uh, if anyone wants to start the conversation going, um, I would particularly keen to try and get uh, uh, Marina or Antonio or some of the, uh, or, or Jane, who are part of the, um, or Theodore, uh, part of our new uh, 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 Digital Futures Young committee to, 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 to wade in there. I think, you know, I'll just say one thing is that, you know, I, I think several of those of the group were in the theory workshop and now to see what was going on in the design workshop, I think is really, really fascinating. So. Um, yeah. Does anyone want to kick things off? I can I try. I, I, I can start if, if you want. OK, yeah, go ahead. OK, just to take the, the, the call. Uh, no, I, um, I think it's an incredible work. I mean, it's uh, uh, the, the multiple examples and uh, the way how you produce in a short time, uh, I think it's incredible. Uh, so uh, thank you for showing us your, your production and the way as you think. Uh, I, I have some questions about some specific works, but I think that I can open it for a general uh, discussion also. Uh, for example, I, I was thinking about this uh, idea of process uh, that uh, one of you mentioned about, uh, I think it was also, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing the, 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 the um, Last yes, name, that's, no? that, that's my <laughs> last name, yes. Okay, okay, great. Now, uh, um, I was thinking about um, uh, what you say about the process, about just go to the result, that nobody is interested in process. Uh, and, uh, and so I want to discuss this idea because I'm super interested in process. I think it's a way to open the black box and it's a way to control how we go to some uh, results. And also uh, from my historical approach, I mean, I'm... Uh, I'm a, I finished my master's degree in history. Uh, my thesis is more about theory, but anyway, I'm interested in historical processes. So I was thinking about uh, how uh, we can control something, uh, some things if we know the process, how you go to, the, to, to there, and also how you, you go to one result, but this result is going to continue uh, in the time so this, this process is going to continue as well and it's going to be changed by users, by different contexts in a way. So I was thinking about this idea just to, to jump to a, to a conversation with all of you. Do you, mean, yeah. do you mind, do you mind yeah. if I jump in on that? We can, we can have a, a duet, I think, about that. Sure, uh, go ahead. If that's okay, uh, because this is a really interesting question. I mean, the, the problem with this conversation is Imagine we would be all musicians, yeah, not architects, musicians, and we're discussing a concert, yeah. We as musicians would probably discuss the technique of the violinist, like how good is he doing that. But if I'm an audience, I'm interested into the emotional impact the concert has on me, right? I'm not so interested in the perfect technique that that violinist is using. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think what Gubench is, is trying to emphasize here is that at the end of the day, whatever technique or methodology or process we're using, 
it is really what impact does have the work as a cultural artifact, as a part of, a, of an aesthetic idea, as, uh, as part of a longer trajectory of the discipline. So all of the things, of course, has, has importance in terms of the impact of the work for a, large, for a large audience. But because we're an expert audience here, we are, of course, allowed to, to, to have a, a peek under the hood, you know, understanding how the engine is actually running because we want to share that notion so that other people can do that too, yeah? So I think you have to differentiate who's the audience of that conversation of, of uh, methodology, technique, or as you were saying, process, yeah? Uh, yes, I, I totally agree with Matthias, but I would also like to add that we have to be aware, in my opinion, about the history of an emphasis on process in uh, recent architectural history. And I would say that the, the you know, majority of process driven um, approaches, I think, also set up a very, uh, I would say, strict hierarchies of, um, of, I would say, privilege in the sense that uh, you can have access to particular technological processes or theoretical processes from a very specific point of view that I think is uh, very much so dominant uh, through this kind of, uh, I would say, the last 30 years, 40 years of process-driven architecture, which ties itself to notions of autonomy, which ties itself to notions of, I would say, a Marxism, uh, from a kind of a intellectual standpoint. And those uh, claims to autonomy were generated uh, as, a, as a kind of a political uh, standpoint. But I think, in fact, what they, how they unfold in the world of uh, architecture is that they are uh, also mechanisms of academic control. I don't want to get too much into that. Uh, and... Um, but what I'm trying to say is that the kind of the linear um, process of process in the sense that you have a methodology that is novel, that is generated through a certain canon of, of, of architectural thinking and the way that it kind of dominates the discussion is I think, uh, I would say one of, the, one of the things that I have always felt uncomfortable with uh, in my training as an architect and what I find liberating about the contemporary use of um, uh, algorithmic approaches and how they differ from the more recent uses of them is that they actually uh, disrupt this uh, linearity of process in the sense that you get the product or a closer view of the product. For example, in the pix to pix algorithm, you get the final rendering before you even uh, finish the design. And I think that kind of absence of uh, linearity uh, in a way forces you uh, to, to question the importance of the tool. And I think the, 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 the kind of very tool centric uh, approach uh, really empowers the person who generates the tool rather than the person who can use the tool for a particular objective. And I find that to be a very kind of a problematic uh, emphasis in the sense that it always forces architects to pretend to be experts in different fields that they're not trained to be in. And, uh, and it actually starts to disrupt the, the essence of uh, architecture as a, as a kind of a cultural expression. Uh, and um, so that's why I think uh, there's a certain kind of... Um, um, I would say um, lack of linearity or also, but also even a ease of use that is, that is less so related to craft, but more about uh, crafting a thought and the methodology and approach in, in machine learning, for example, because the closed box system and then you curate a data set and then you get a result and then you have to pick the result that you think is relevant. Therefore, you have to, in a way, design the parameters of the process rather than let's say taking the process such as downloading a grasshopper code and applying it to your design right so in that regard i find it to be much more culturally relevant and i think that is the reason why it it produces less self-fulfilling results 
And I think uh, one of the problems with like computational design, and I think the reason why uh, the theoretical um, side of the discourse lost interest in, in, in kind of these technological driven schemes is that it was basically cyclical in the sense that the person who invents the tool has an immense amount of control over the, what the tool produces. And when all these people are using the same tool, uh, the, the, the kind of the set of, uh, or uh, library of uh, production and objectives uh, narrow down further and further. And I think uh, for us to, in a way, battle that and in a way, uh, celebrate the diversity of production in architectural discourse. I think it is very important to uh, maybe focus more on uh, ideas rather than methods uh, in order to, uh, in a way, talk about the validity of those ideas. And also, I'm just going to finish wrap up, but to uh, Matthias's point, I think it also has to, a lot to do with the, with the kind of a I would say demographic and cultural makeup of the dominant voices in architecture in the sense that uh, the person who invents the tool is also the creative genius and then those are somehow intrinsically combined and uh, and i think that is something uh, that is very um i mean disconcerting uh, in the sense that that is one of the one of the main uh, i would say um approaches that we need it, we need to bring into the combination of technology and architecture or technological approaches towards architecture in order to question those, uh, those notions. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, a lot of these uh, technologically driven uh, procedural uh, systems of thought originate from, um, you know, from early 90s or, you know, late 80s and, you know, the kind of the the invention of animate, animated tools, either uh, in an analog way or in a digital way. And we're still kind of like stuck in that, in that cycle, right? And I think uh, this uh, disruption of linearity in the creative process, I think really reverses that cycle. And that's why I'm excited about it. That's why I consider it to, it to be brand new. The fact that it has to do with artificial intelligence is somehow over the years becoming less and less interesting to me and the fact that it's a cultural disruptive tool within the confines of architectural academia is much more interesting to me. Yeah, maybe I could just sort of comment, because I, I think it's, it, uh, there was, I, I forget who it was, I think it was Yuko Venture saying that actually from a theoretical point of view, there's less, less interest. I, I personally think, well, I'm, I'm part of the, the theorists who are interested in it. I think that it mm -hmm. does raise some super interesting kind of questions. And uh, I certainly think that, uh, well, Mamal Delander has kind of has already written about what said what largely what you said that we kind of shifted towards from being maybe a top down controller to be a controller of processes. You unleash these things and you see what is generated. But what I also think is interesting about him was the way that he he would focus on process. This is back in the 90s as a way of kind of response or a counterbalance to the overemphasis on representation during the age of postmodernism. And he he took a kind of largely Deleuzian view whereby process of representation were kind of in a, in a locked into a, a mechanism reciprocal presupposition. You couldn't have one without the other, but the point was up until then, there'd been too much emphasis on representation. And now the shift was towards process. I tend to think that the, the, the pendulum's kind of swung back the other way to some extent in, sure. in architectural design circles. And it's now a, a kind of a, a, a shift back towards the, the, the logic of representation. But I'd want to keep alive the, the notion of process because uh, to avoid just getting into some kind of superficial uh, representational sort of discourse like what what ai can do is 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 in a, is is kind of be disruptive as as a, 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 a in part of the process of, of generation of images so i think that marina's question is goes to the heart of really what this whole um, <clears throat> new tool is, what this newly discovered tool, shall we say, for architects, is opening up in terms of architectural uh, production. Uh, Neil, just a quick question. Don't you think that we, we do have a problem of rep the representational problem with the AI work getting generated because like 95% of the work is imagery. It's just images. It, it's not 3D models. It's not a representation of something spatial. It's again, just another form of painting. No, yeah, uh, so absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. No, I, I, and I, but, I understand. But in, 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 okay. in, in our workshop with Daniel, we generated these kind of images 
manipulating a surface and using Grasshopper, we transferred these images into uh, RGB, then XYZ into a final surface. So we started with a surface on Rhino and Grasshopper, manipulating using the networks and so on, having the alternatives and take it back into Grasshopper to transfer the image into a kind of surface. But it, it's a, a it's a planar surface somehow using manipulation in Z, but not a three-dimensional surface, it, not yet. But, but, you know. It needs to be mentioned. That's the five percent I refer to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, okay. I mean, but also like what I meant by representation was not necessarily architectural representation. I meant literally representation of people and ideas in the in the field, right? And I think uh, that to me is 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 a part of a kind of a larger structural issue. And I think the relationship of technological uh, workflows and processes in architecture and, and the kind of ownership that is being uh, claimed around them, right? Somehow the, the production of ideas uh, are originating from the West and the production of processes or the follow through of them are, are more or, you know, going towards the East, right? And, and this kind of paradigm is, I think, very much so related to the dominance of language. And, uh, and, the, the, and, the, and the kind of like mechanisms that produce theory uh, that support particular processes. And so in that regard, I think the, 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 the culture of images is actually a quite a productive tool uh, because uh, it actually creates a more of a association with a, with a larger body of images that are accessible on the internet or accessible uh, in, the, in the culture, world culture at large. Uh, right. Rather than, uh, you know, rather than resorting to particular aesthetic paradigms that are geared towards generating particular three-dimensional results, right? Because then you can dismiss yourself from those uh, mechanisms to a certain point. I, I think you're basically also touching here on the problem of bias in AI. Like basically how you how you operate around the problem, the training, uh, for example, generative adversarial network almost instantly also generates a biased uh, solution. Yeah. But on the other hand, you can also reverse the process and uh, use it as an inclusive tool because you're actually able to train a network to understand more than just Western architecture and the Western canon that we know. It's actually also for the same process possible to interrogate any other cultural implication mm -hmm. in terms of architecture. Exactly. And through the combination of two things, I think, I think training is going to be the basic job we're going to do in the future as architects. So we're going to have to train networks to understand the variations in our cultural expressions in terms of architecture and how they can contribute to a novel architectural solution. And for me, the most exciting part is actually that, that novelty, although novelty is always a complicated word and problematic word, it can also emphasize something that is outside our current understanding of what architecture actually her base exactly. and i think that could be super exciting if yeah i, I just if i can oh. go, go. Go, ahead. go ahead if i can touch on the on this idea of training and also novelty I'm, i i i bring a, a sort of a bit more engineering let's say background into this so the immediately i thought what you said training that 95 percent at least of my involvement in kind of developing machine learning workflows is in data generation and not training right it's in how to actually produce the content required to learn something useful and that we can use to, produce, to design something, right? And in the examples that I see, I want to play a bit of the devil's advocate. I show a lot of generative models that are kind of like pre-trained or not. And I, I wonder if they are really, if we are really producing something novel here, how, how are we defining the novelty? Because, because the way I understand these models, they can, they can produce really, they interpolate through a, a large, let's say, corpus of ideas, right? But, I'm, I don't think they can ever produce something entirely new. Like they, there isn't this process of, let's say, evolution of design in this tool. So, so I wonder how, how do people think we're gonna grasp with this issue of, on the one side, like how do we create new things? How, how can we create new solutions, let's say, or even find new problems through new design processes? And on the other side, the other thing that I, I, I find I, I find I miss a bit in the generative design, and I had my my also my my problems with generative design, computational design because of this, is the lack of connection to performance. And I, I wonder if if anyone here thinks about 
and how can we connect this to actual how things work in the world? So how do they impact occupants, for example, or citizens? So I think this is the, the maybe a hardest part. I wonder if anyone has seen that. I think we still have to take those steps, Theodoros. I mean, I, I agree with you partially on the one side. Guvenc also talked about aspects, for example, of in, you know inspiration or interpretation of results that you get out of the networks at the moment. And that is because we still don't have enough control over the process to go again to Marina's argument. Yeah. So, but the, I think these are all things that we're currently, exp you, we, you're going to see very fast of things happening. Like at the moment, I think we're using it as, uh, we are as architects curiously looking into that tool set, understanding how it can contribute to our discipline in a meaningful way. Yeah, but it's going to be so fast that people are going to start training those networks to optimize things. This is going to be super fast. I mean, you can probably see that already in half a year from now, you will see people optimizing for space use, for uh, performance in structure or performance in ecological ways. But I'm not entirely sure whether this is just, this is just one part of those goals. I think that there is like this, this universe is so big that it allows us also to interrogate it just culturally. And I think that's what at least I'm interested into because I'm rather interested into the wicked problem than the tame problem that engineering actually represents in that realm. Yeah, maybe I just add something there. I think it really depends on the, the tool that you're using because I mean, topological optimization, which is good old fashioned AI has been around for a while and that's been used uh, um, for structural optimization or, or, already. Um, but in terms of kind of the tool itself, I, you know, I think that, that if you're dealing with, with kind of with, with GANs, you get different versions of GANs. And I think creative GANs kind of opens up the possibility of, of going beyond the, the kind of the data set you originally start with. But I, I guess what I, I, my, I hold out the hope that eventually um, what we're gonna find is actually uh, the, the generation of novel outputs, I don't want to call them designs, but novel outputs that kind of in a way w wouldn't have been expected out of, out of a, a typical kind of um, a human architect generator. Uh, I'm thinking here of, of two examples. One was the kind of famous, this move 37 in, in game two of Lee Sedol, where this move came out that nobody had, had thought about before, no one had anticipated, uh, that, and that effectively changed the game of Go. But also uh, in our discussion um, uh, with Wan Yu, with uh, uh, Hover Hochland of Spacemaker AI, where they use some kind of AI technique to kind of, to, to generate outcomes. They actually once that happened that, that that something came out out of the out of the computer that no architect would have imagined. Um, no architect would have imagined it was co totally counterintuitive. And I think that's my hope in some way is that suddenly we're going to get some game changers coming out of this uh, different approach towards things that are going to open up new 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 ways of thinking about architecture. Uh, if I may, I, I would I would like to drag in Emmanuel in this conversation because actually what he was showing, specifically the convolutional neural network he was working on, showed like some examples that were optimized, so to speak, which are which had these kind of black voxels and the ones which, which were weaker, yeah? And funny enough, I thought the weaker models are the far more interesting models than the ones that are like optimized and perfect. And, and that shows actually that we even as humans do decisions, not only in regards of the optimization uh, aspect, but actually as the performance as a cultural um, artifact. Yeah, Because for me, the, spatially speaking, the weaker ones were definitely more interesting. And I would, I'm curious what Emmanuel says about that. Oh, oh, now that you mentioned, that's why I actually think that process is very important. Uh, the reason why I was trying to visualize the probability distribution of the voxels is unless I dig deep in, into the process, right? If I just see it as a black box, I could never be able to visualize how the machine is seeing it. And therefore, using that knowledge to, I suppose, even, even to just theorize this idea of a strong and a weak form, right? I would not be, if we're just looking at the white boxes. We, there's no way to conclude about anything. But once we look at the probability distribution, it makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, so I, I, and also to some extent, since we've been talking a lot about 2D and I sometimes wonder our obsession with this representation or this, as you put it, I mean, I, I do agree to, to some extent, but I also disagree to the, some other extent. Maybe we're too kind of obs too much obsessed with the representation if maybe in the next half a year, we'll see like this rampant, you know, images, like I'm not saying that style transfer is not good or good or not uh, bad. I'm just saying that, is it 
might we hit this ceiling? Like picks to picks, right? We really hit this ceiling. Uh, like previously, I was playing with, for instance, conditional um, style transfer, right? But I can't change the global shape. I'm still stuck with that. So that's why I decided to kind of just go straight for three D. I don't try to um, try to pretend as like a two D of the three D and go through stages. I'm mean, nothing wrong with that. It's just my own kind of opinion. I think, you know, because I kind of hit a ceiling also when I was just trying so hard to just convert the two D. Yeah, yeah. But I think related to that, like it depends on what the end goal is, right? You know, is the end goal to automate the entire procedure of design? Is 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 that the objective behind it, right? Is it is the end goal to optimize uh, certain processes in order to streamline design, right? Or is the end goal uh, introduce a new kind of uh, paradigm or process into a system that can enhance your creative workflow? So I think uh, what is interesting about uh, these approaches is that I think uh, in terms of its capacity to enhance the creative workflow, I have found it over the last two years like uh, very uh, productive to be engaged in, 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 in these algorithms. But I think you're completely right in the sense that it really uh, fails to deliver the kind of the more standard approach that we would have from a computational process, right, which is about optimization, which is about reduction of steps, which is about, you know, basically taking away the mundane process and the manual process and like automating it so that, you know, it is more efficiently deployed in a larger scale. And I think it is, it also has to do with our expectations from machines, right? I think our traditional expectation from machines is that they basically take on the tasks that humans don't find interesting or inspirational or relevant or uh, you know we always say machines don't have creativity therefore humans you know are unique in that realm uh, that we are the kind of like the gatekeepers of uh, creative production and uh, machines can be the the kind of like the 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 producers of of, of that of that uh, you know content right and they optimize us. So in that regard, like I, the way that I, I found it, the way that I look at it is that, you know, uh, we are still in a, a operating in the realm of a society of images. And this is basically uh, an image analysis tool that is subverted into an image creation tool uh, in its essence. So I find that to be an interesting uh, reversal about the objective of the of the technology into something that is being used for what it is not designed to do. I, I'm just wondering whether whether I mean we say we. It's what's interesting thing when you bring literally the whole world together, literally the whole world together, whether you get a sort of um, you notice the differences between different cultures. I mean, I think for example, uh, in the West, especially within a kind of French intellectual scene, there was critique of images in the 80s and 90s that came, or actually came out of Guy Debord through to Jean Baudrillard. And there was a critique of, 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 the, of, of hyper-reality of images and so on and so on. Now we didn't, China missed out on that, I assume. And you know, I think what's interesting about the Chinese scenario is it's a very different cultural background in which criticism itself is just beginning to emerge as a proper discourse. And I, you know, I, I, I look forward to seeing what happens when you bring that together with the kind of incredible um, productivity and, and hard work going on in, in China at the moment to see whether a kind of criticality might emerge and a criticali criticality towards, towards images. Uh, I want to just kind of mention a question here that, uh, that was in one of the chats by Emiliano da Conciasso. I, I, my pronunciation of Portuguese is not very good, um, but this is the question. Um, Given the ample spectrum of institutions with which the different in instructors are affiliated around the world, I would like to know what is the weight of these explorations in the schools in which they are being delivered? What kind of novel architectural in intuitions emerge and how are they affecting the production of the schools, the production of, I guess, design in the schools, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, 
that's the kind of general question. I mean, I, I, I think it's fair to say, just as a kind of comment, is, is that, that still we're seeing, it, it, I mean, AI is not, I mean, I'm sure it's going to explode onto the scene in the next next uh, few months even. Um, it is already exploding, but it's, it's kind of isolated pockets. I, I kind of noticed that, that LA somehow becomes a place of production for various reasons, and it hasn't necessarily spread everywhere, although hopefully as a result of this workshop, it will start spreading everywhere. But anyway, does anyone want to kind of uh, answer that question? If I may. Uh, so, I mean, at, at, uh, at Dartmouth College, at the University of Michigan, uh, this, the, the good thing about the, uh, the effort in Michigan is, and Neil mentioned it briefly, is that it's a, a genuinely interdisciplinary effort. So it's not just the architecture department working on architecture problems. Uh, in terms of uh, AI applications, but it's also computer science who, with uh, Justin Johnson, who is one of the programmers of PyTorch 3D, and with several people at robotics who are actually machine vision specialists. And Gubinch mentioned often that these techniques come actually out of machine vision. Uh, and so we are in the process of establishing a, a working group between different disciplines specifically working on applications for architecture and we are as there, there are so many ideas that came up in the last year alone that we are we are really looking for more people to work on these problems because they don't not only entail theoretical problems in architecture they entail very practical problems like who's going to code specific things who's going to test specific things and so there's like all this and in addition because we have this large fab lab at Taubman College we of course talking about the opportunities to combine AI applications with fabrication. So that it doesn't stay just as a rendering or image, but also becomes physical reality. Yeah, and this is something where we are investing some time and effort and energy in that. And I'm happy that we are co continuously growing in that area. Yeah, I guess I mean, maybe I, I could add a bit of, uh, yeah, from, from in Singapore. Uh, I, I'm at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. so. Uh, recently, we launched a new program called Design and AI, uh, of which I have a joint appointment, but I'm the only architect there. And so is the, if you look, look at the curriculum, it's basically bringing um, some of the architecture studio setup in a rather um, kind of engineering uh, perspective. So we actually do like system design as well, as I think the uh, Kafa group was talking about just now. Um, also product design and there's this space design with which I'm actually kind of in charge. So there, there is this huge kind of push, not just at the, on an institutional level, but at the national level. Uh, in, in the case of Singapore, you probably know that we're always talking about smart nation and, and there's this whole AI Singapore thing going on, lots of uh, interesting opportunities. Uh, but at this point in time, surprisingly, the uh, its effects on architecture design sensibility or, or it has yet to kind of emerge uh but it has or in in our case it's still seen a pretty much kind of a problem solving uh context uh which is where the money comes from also yeah yeah i'm just i'm just wondering whether when it does become more prevalent in architectural culture what kind of backlash there might be <clears throat> towards it. I mean, I just last yesterday was reading a book, AI Art, which from a professor from, from Goldsmiths, actually a very uh, um, critical way of interpreting AI, which I thought was very unhealthy in many ways. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wonder, I, you know, that the art, uh, the art scene clearly is, is skeptical in some ways of, 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 of what might be called AI art. But I'm just wondering whether we need to sort of, in a way, step beyond this kind of framework. I mean, the problem I think is always that we judge things from a kind of human-centered sort of basis of things. And my argument has always been, we've got to get to a second Copernican revolution where we don't see us as a center of things. We don't look at this technology in, and judge it in human terms. It can't do what we do in things, but rather be open to the possibilities of what it might do, in, in which case it might open up a new paradigm of operations in the world of architecture. This is, this is really a funny thing about it is that the more you know about these techniques and the more you apply them, the more you figure out how much manual work is necessary to make yeah. really handsome, you know, uh, make it work as an architectural piece. Uh, I mean, if, if I can share quickly my screen for a second, uh, we actually are working on a building project um, that 
uh, is done with the robotics department of the University of Michigan. Let me go quickly back here, which is called the Robot Garden. Yes, this one here. And basically it's a test ground for the bipedal robots. Yeah. And uh, the whole interior of that lens shaped piece is, is the robot garden. And we work together with Michigan Robotics on a variety of techniques to uh, implement that site with various different geological conditions because they need it for the tests. Okay, so this is basically now, these are some of the processes that we used for uh, doing style transfer between the models and it's under construction right now. It, this, build, this picture is pretty old. I think it's from February or March. So it's basically almost finished now, yeah. But uh, just quickly speaking, it, the, the amount that it took from to, to have like tons of different style transfer images to some images that were useful to, try to use them somehow in, in, the, in the process of really doing a construction site out of that. And the whole planning process on top of it, the planning process, drawing the drawings and so on, was basically manual. Yeah, it was not automated or anything. These, are, uh, these steps are a little bit farther away. They're not far, far away, but they're a little bit farther away. And, but it shows you also, where do we need to work on this technique so that they can achieve things that are really useful for us? Because useful AI would be, for example, if they take over this whole boring process of doing the planning for construction and leaves more time for me to be creative in some way. Yeah, that, that was certainly the view that's been espoused by, by many people, the idea of allowing humans to be more human by taking away some of the drudgery of the, of the, the work. Can I just uh, introduce some questions that have been on the chat uh, from Doris Shi? Uh, Since the technology is too advanced versus real industry, I'm wondering if Silicon Valley has any set up programs that, in, uh, that are encouraging the developing co collaboration that we can participate in. I guess my students have been using Runway. Um, but I, I do, I do think that kind of it would be nice if we could try and think of a way of, 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 of spreading the information on this platform or indeed on the on the Discord platform about how we could be introducing uh, more students to this because it is actually still a very uh, specialized area and there is a huge demand out there for, for from students to find out about things. Um, the I second, think, yeah, uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, no. go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think a very, a very important step to make is. What I found when I entered this field and I started to learn, I tried to learn how to apply it right in my, in my let's say, in my craft. The biggest problem was what I call the tyranny of the amnest. Like if you, if you start doing anything in AI or machine learning, you, you will notice the hello world. The, the first simplest example is the amnest data set, right? And every tutorial out there, almost all tutorials out there that are very helpful and open source and from people that really know their content is based on almost the same examples that have nothing to do typically with the real world applications that we wanna, we want to use the models. So I think a big step towards democratizing this access would be to share actual architectural applications. So what happened with this diffuser, for example, was that, that the knowledge to how to apply this kind of tools in architectural practice or in engineering practice, that's the biggest step. So if we can provide a small compendium of these examples, I think it will make very, very big help in allowing access to it. Well, that's certainly one of the things we're hoping to do with some of the outcomes of this workshop, try and to disseminate that so people can see what's going on. I think this is why this particular event is, is I mean, I, I, I find it mind blowing the range of different approaches out there and you really get a sense of, of, um, of what's, what's going on. Can I ask again to another question that comes from the chat uh, from Ricardo Cesar Rodriguez? Would you guys say latent, say latent space interpolation or even constant use of such tools might help designers to make stronger readings about how designers solve problems in the design process? That's a bit convoluted. Can I say it again? Would you guys say latent space interpolation or even constant use of such tools might help designers to make stronger readings about how designers solve problems in the design process? Yeah, so. I think this relates a bit to the idea of design recommendation, I would guess. So understanding and extracting from what actually the designer is doing, extracting a sort of latent space of the designer itself, I guess that's, that's how you would approach. There are some similar ideas in gaming. So in gaming, there is something called player modeling. So where there are actually tools and algorithms and similar models to model the player as they're experiencing or playing the, a game. And I feel this might have some value in 
There are not yet any design interfaces that can do this, but there could be design interfaces where exploration happens through machine learning, and at the same time, the sort of profile of the designer himself or herself can be described or developed. Maybe that's an interesting idea. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I can just add, add to that. I think, I mean, it's not doesn't really quite answer this question, but I think, to my mind, as a kind of theorist, what makes this whole world so interesting is how you can almost take AI as a mirror in which to understand how human intelligence works. There's certain insights you can get from that. And uh, certainly in terms of, of design approaches, uh, uh, that's been part of what I've been writing about in the lecture, my first lecture of the in intelligence thing, I touch on those things. I think it's opening up a whole series of interesting kind of questions about how we as humans operate. And, you know, frankly, just going back to this kind of question about whether it produces anything new in terms of design, I think we've got to question how creative we are as architects, because I, I find there's a kind of mimetic principle, you know, we kind of follow on pretty closely to what's been done before. If you do something too outrageous, it's dismissed as not being architecture, whereas if it's a little bit like Zaha, you tweak it a bit, then it's okay. So, um, uh, yeah, there's another question that's come in from, from um, uh, Ahmed Hassab. Um, I have a question. Neil, maybe I could, sorry, Neil, right. maybe I could just respond to that question, uh, the interpolation. I, I think it's a good question. Um, for, from a design practice point of view, I think it's actually useful because it allows you to see um, relationships between uh, generated design. In, in the old days, uh, we would write code based on rules, it would generate different uh, options, but we don't actually see the relationships. But once you have that latent space, it becomes possible to somehow find the right solution because it is continuous. Yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, Christopher, so I'm, I'm at Hassab's question. I have a question to X cool. The, the application converts curves to 3D application is, is very helpful. Would it be available some, somehow to try? Uh, it seems very promising in the near future. Uh, I think I know the answer to that one now, but, but uh, uh, Wan Yu, do you want to uh, respond to that? Is it going to be available yes. to us in the West? Uh, I think so. Um... Since um, this uh, coronavirus kind of uh, segregated um, all the countries, I think uh, maybe it's also easier for us to uh, somehow unite our internet. So uh, we're also um, uh, starting to see what's the possibility for overseas. And um, um, yeah, that could be possible soon. That's what I uh, can say. But uh, uh, meanwhile, I also uh, like talked to, to this uh, space maker, and uh, I think they are also doing quite well um, in different way. So we are thinking, is there any possibility to work with them as well? So um, yeah, and I hope there could be more communications uh, since uh, we cannot really meet together anymore. <laughs> yeah, just a while. Just to kind of comment, I mean, I, 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 I just kind of want to repeat that that discussion is really interesting. It's, it's, it's recorded on our YouTube discussion. But I think one yeah, of the, yeah. the things that you do find, this is kind of a, a theoretical issue, is as soon as you bring things together, then you notice the differences, right? And in some ways, when, when you got together with, with Hovad, uh, Wanyu, what became clear is actually uh, uh, you guys are operating in a very different way in China because of the data sets that you're using that, that, that were, were very different and very specific to, to Chinese culture. So it's difficult to, to, to often to kind of extend that model um, universally. Right. Uh, because China is more driven by real estate developments. So most of our data, especially for the, for the most cases we're using um, the real estate uh, developments, and which has a lot of projects going on each year. Um, I think that data might be the most uh, in the world at this moment. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a way to cut in. I, I know there's a other possibility to use AI for public buildings for different types of uh, programs, but uh, now we are really focusing in this uh, real estate developments not only because of their reach, it's because of uh, this field that has the most uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have some more questions from the audience? Antonio? I, I, yeah, I had a question actually related to the, to the first one. 
um, somehow then to a theme that uh, they recurred in a few of the discussions and it was related to the amount of human or actually even manual operations that are, are done in the process. No, I, I kind of agree that um, uh, the, the point is what portion of the process of design is done by artificial intelligence. Not necessarily, it's always the same. And therefore, the logics or the objective that it has might be very different. So, uh, like uh, uh, also was saying, uh, no, in earlier example, the aim was to automate the generation of the result. No? But the intuition ultimately was human at the beginning. Whether in the style transfer examples that they have shown, uh, instead, the the algorithm is what generates the vision. So the design intention is actually that vision that is machine generated. And then whether that vision then translates into a, a spatial structure automatically or by human process, that's less relevant because the, the core is that the machine generates the vision. So the design intention, no? And in that, when, when doing that, then it's when it can escape human preconception no? and become uh, one of those counterintuitive solutions like the, the move of Go. No? Uh, so but at the end of the day, the point is also, I guess, uh, how to, uh, to use human or manual operations in a way that is less human. No? And I found very, very compelling the the comparison of the Amazon M Turk that at the end of the day is human energy, you no know, human operations that are used with the with the machine logic, you no, know, with an artificial logic. So it's a crowd sources of human human energy through a machine logic that therefore escapes our preconception. And I mean, I, I wanted to know whether Ocel or Matthias that were working on style gans uh, that's actually a sorry that, that's a great question i mean that's really a good question it goes directly into this whole conversation about agency authorship yeah like all these sort of things that are, are really gravitating around the conversation of ai and it of course profoundly discusses how do we operate as architects in a post-human world um i mean there is several examples of 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 instances that show that there is already something out there that is only readable by AIs and not readable anymore by humans. Let, let's say, for example, the Amazon warehouse, yeah, where you have like millions of products that are not organized alphabetically, they're not organized by topics, yeah, they're not organized how we logically as humans would organize a warehouse. They're obviously organized by demand, and the only person or instance that is able to read within that maze of elements and pieces and, and products is um, an, an, uh, an algorithm that um, gives uh, the person who has to pick up the product for shipping out, they have a handheld device and that actually shows them where to find specific products and without that handheld device this person would be lost in that warehouse. Yeah. So this is already something uh, James Bridle described this as uh, people becoming flash algorithms, yeah, which means that they're part of a larger program that is computational, and they're only fulfilling one part of that algorithm yeah, as part of a larger set of rules within that algorithm. And this is happening very often now. So you see that the same problem, by the way, is with Uber. Yeah? Uber drivers have no idea of the city they're, they're driving around. They're, they're all controlled by an algorithm that tells them where to go. And they're just following rules that an algorithm is giving them. So people become flash algorithms, so to speak. Yeah? The question is, how, how, where in this sort of universe are we as architects, right? Because we are so proud of our creativity and our, your intuition, things that were until very recently very hard to compute and probably still are hard to compute in a specific way, yeah? But, I think that uh, Guven touched on that already before. There is this, this idea of using the results that are given to us by specific neural networks as a source of interpretation and inspiration. Yeah, so we as humans, as architects at least by now, yeah, today, we are still taking those results and interpret them as something that can become architecture. Um, and, and I think that's where currently there is a lot of interpretation and manual work involved, right? 
But I think that that, that is going to disappear very quickly. Uh, as when those algorithms become more sophisticated, when the training becomes better, when the databases become better accessible, for generative adversarial networks and other kinds of neural networks, that processes Absolutely. are going to become simpler and simpler. Yeah, but and if you want, uh, if my, I may add to this, at the end of the day, a, a generative adversarial network is based on generation and discrimination. No, so as as uh, also one you was was showing, the process of discrimination is is the core when like the artificial algorithm starts to make decisions, no? start to select. That That's, is what we always considered was the human part. You know? the, exactly. creative, the human creativity was in the selection process. Whether That's now what, the yeah. machine does the selection, that's no, the not necessarily. part because it does not select uh, with our preconceptions. Not necessarily, because I think that's why I was emphasizing before that training a neural network will become one of our main jobs in the future. We are the yeah. discriminators. We are actually telling, you know, which kind of databases, what's the qualities of the images they're oh. seeing. So we are actually the, doing these sort of things. We, and we then later those, it can train on itself. Yeah, yeah, but we are those who influence the way a machine will discriminate. <laughs> Yeah, but also I think one thing that is important to remember is that the databases that these algorithms operate on are also produced by humans. Uh, you know, the when you're using style transfer, uh, the image that you're that you're selecting, whether it's a painting or a picture of a sculpture or or even a photograph or what have you, those are all filtered through the lens of humans. So the database creation is also a very human process that, uh, you know, and we talked about bias earlier, and that that actually allows the, the human biases to be carried into and amplified by these algorithms, which is uh, in some cases something desirable, in other cases not so much. Uh, but I think what is important to remember is that um, the what I find interesting about uh, machine learning and uh, using image databases uh, as, as algorithms that is, is that it is, it is less of an, I would say a modernist project or a parametric project, but I would say that it's almost more of a neo postmodern project in the sense that it engages with the culture of images very directly and their meaning and, uh, and uh, looking at uh, a kind of a creation of a database for a particular purpose to train an algorithm is a highly, I would say, historical approach because you're looking at a kind of a creation of a library of a particular uh, genre, particular aesthetic. If you're working in the computer vision, you're looking at a particular context, which also requires like a highly, highly kind of calibrated cultural judgment uh, for a particular uh, operation. So I would say that, uh, you know, it, it operates more in the, in the direct repository of history rather than in the realm of metaphors. And I think that that is really important because if you look at uh, the relationship of, let's say, algorithmic approaches uh, pre-machine uh, learning, uh, which is about, let's say, uh, parametric or procedural approaches that are, that are so-called inspired by nature, right? Those inspirations were always relying on a certain set of abstractions uh, about about observation, but that set of abstractions about observation are no longer relevant in this process. You can just take an image of something and put it into the database, and uh, you can create much more, I would say, diverse sets of data uh, rather than uh, trying to devise a very specific uh, computational tool to achieve a particular metaphorical representation of something, right? So in that regard, I find the possibilities to be much more open-ended and sophisticated and unpredictable. Yeah. Can I just, to, 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 I think Antonio, that was a fantastic question you just asked. And I think, I'm just wondering whether it, you know, this whole process forces us to rethink those assumptions. I mean, what's happening increasingly now is we, is the AI is becoming kind of muse. It's kind of throwing out these possibilities, and we get inspired by them and we adopt them. And uh, so, and I think humans have this incredible capacity to judge very immediately 
whether you like it or not. And the, 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 the AI is generating this kind of stuff and so on. And so in a way, it, we've, we've kind of shifted that operation from this notion of the, of, of the, the brain of the architect in a top-down way, just throwing, you know, producing the stuff to being ourselves a kind of discriminator um, of the material coming out from the, from the computer. And one of the views about why AI cannot be genuinely creative is the, is the Melanie Mitchell makes this comment, is that it doesn't, it's not aware of, of how good the stuff is, you know, it, it can't tell it's, it just generates the stuff. It can play chess, can play go. It doesn't know it's doing that. It doesn't can't evaluate the, 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 the outcome of a, des, of a process, a design process. However, I want to ask this kind of question, whether, whether actually we are operating in the way we thought we were. I mean, in the sense that if you think about a dream, a dream actually is often erupts out of the unconscious. We're not even conscious about it. It just kind of appears. We might then, uh, appreciate it and think about it and memorize it and so on and think that was an amazing dream. But I'm just wondering whether the creative process is quite as 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 based on consciousness as we think and whether it isn't some kind of eruption of, out of, of an idea that comes from somewhere else that we're not in control of. I, I just think that you've, that you've opened up a can of worms, Antonio, but I think it's a really interesting one about uh, challenging our previous assumptions about, I mean, the discriminator model. Your question was great. I mean, I have to admit that it, the, I, I'm one of those people who has been writing about creativity and AI, and I was very, very enthusiastic about it. But the more I know about how actually these neural networks and algorithms actually work, the more I'm suspicious about my own opinion. Yeah, Because basically, uh, the, what we have to understand is that these neural networks have a very, very limited understanding of the world in general. So they have no idea what creativity is. And, and thus, thus the, the, the aspect of self-reflection does not exist within this universe. Yeah. So, but on the other side, we as humans have this really strange ability to recognize, for example, a mistake as an opportunity. Yeah. Which still is almost impossible for for computational methodologies to somehow replicate. Yeah. So for a, for a computer, still a result is either correct or it's not correct. The middle way to say to 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 tweak it to something that becomes creatively interesting does not exist yet. A good example for, for the sort of limited understanding of the world is the famous uh, Google Deep Dream algorithm that you can see online, where you, you put in an image and suddenly you see like birds and animals and plants and flowers uh, in your face. Yeah, And the reason why that happens is because the, 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 it basically is a generative adversarial network with an inverse flow of information, which means you expose this neural network to the world, to an image of the world, and because it only understands the world based on birds, dogs, and plants, it will try to make sense out of the world by seeing birds, dogs, and plants in that image. And that's why it transforms those images into what we see then at the end, right? So this, it shows exactly like the limitations of this sort of uh, networks. It, uh, that's why everyone is actually working on, on AIs that are not general, but AIs that are specialized in specific areas, because it, yeah. you need an, you need an, a generalized AI to do these sort of creative things that we as humans try to achieve, right? On the other hand, uh, I, I see this um, uh, absolutely as an opportunity, because if, if this is a, a tool that is basically combining two images into something new, I don't think new, well, again, this is again a, a problematic word, yeah, but I would, for example, not put it in close to any sort of postmodern idea. It's true that it's actually the source material is historic in most cases in architecture, for example, when we're working with the sort of tools. But what results out of that to, uh, out of that information is not an imitation. It's not a copy. It's not um, uh, it, it's not quoting like postmodern architects would do. It's not quoting post, you know, an old idea to emphasize a, sp a specific idea within that architectural device that they're generating. So it's not doing that. Yeah? It's it's basically just trying to make sense out of pixels that it's it, it's confronted with. Yeah, and and the way how we change the weights in that sort of algorithm defines also a lot of what result we're gonna get out of it. We shouldn't forget that we as humans are still like tweaking the engine a lot. Yeah. To get specific results out of it, but, yeah. but let me let me throw something into the mix, then, uh, Matthias. I mean, you, of course, I mean, you know, AI is you have to train it. But to what extent are we also ourselves trained in a certain sort of way, and we're not even aware of that? I mean, the, I don't want to go into examples, but just to say one example would be <clears throat> if you ask someone about the colours in a rainbow, you know, a, a, any school kid will say seven. But we know there's an infinite number of colors in the rainbow. We have been trained in a certain sort of way. And I think we have to look at the architectural education as not being innocent 
it is absolutely training us not so dissimilar to a data set to think in a certain way. I completely agree. And by the way, I was heavily criticized for writing about that, uh, where I was comparing, for example, how students learn what is Baroque, what is Gothic, what is modern, by being uh, confronted with imagery by a discriminator, which is the faculty. They train them to, to understand this is Baroque, this is Gothic. And after seeing like 500 images of Baroque, uh, Baroque churches, they can recognize it again, right? And basically, that's what we're also doing a lot with generative adversarial networks. We are giving them thousands of images of specific things to recognize them around them. That's how the whole machine vision uh, paradigm works that for automated cars, for example, so that they understand what, what's a human and what's a car. Okay. Um, do we have any final final comments to sort of to wrap up? I, I, I must say one thing I, I've got to say, this is, you never quite know um, when you like as an architect, you design a building, you're not going to what the some things always escape what you expect in a good way or in a bad way. And this, when we set this up, I think I hadn't quite a tip, a, appreciated the the kind of the, the level of the discussion and debates that happen that have been facilitated by this platform. I think some really interesting ideas have come come about, and I'm really glad that you guys all took took part in it. Do, do we have any final sort of comments to come in to to before we wrap things up? I said enough, but I just want to say thanks a lot, Neil, for putting this together. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think let's let's see this as the beginning. I, actually, the person you need to thank most of all uh, there, there there are three of them here in this in the group here: uh, Antonio, uh, Marina, and uh, Victoria, who must be watching uh, remotely. But they were the ones who basically during our our uh, theory workshop with with Sanford and, and Marie and Marika and Antoine established a discord thing to keep the debate going and in a way um once that that had established i think you know it's it now we now have a platform where we can continue these debates so i i hope that this is the beginning of something and we can we don't just see digital futures as being a kind of like a, a, a operation in the summer but as a, as a continual a platform for exchanging ideas because i think this kind of uh, exchange is extremely helpful um and uh so I want to thank them. I also, I want to sort of thank all those people who uh, ran these workshops. I mean, I, I must say that uh, not, we didn't manage to get everyone together today, but I think we pretty much had the top guys in the world involved in some way. Um, Senator of China who was in, was in the discussion as well. And, and, and so it was actually, a, we, we managed to get a lot of people together. I think it's been, it's helped to advance this. I just hope that we can find ways of spreading the information further. Um, uh, I think there's the new chapter opening for architecture we should be critical about, but at the same time, I think it's important to be able to expose people to these, these ideas. And I think many people from different parts of the world would otherwise not have had access to this kind, these kind of ideas. You know, um, I keep talking about the, uh, the first moment when we opened up our discussion of our workshop, and we had to mute everyone, but one guy put his hand up and say, hi, Professor, I'm in Lima, Peru. And suddenly you think, what the hell? And I was just looking at the, the list that, that um, Emmanuel Coe had of the people in, in his workshop from all over the world, literally. And it was absolutely astonishing to see uh, that kind of collaboration and also to have you guys together here. So um, thank you to all the workshop instructors for, for doing that. I think, and I think thanks also to the students. I, um, who produced, I mean, I, I've got to say every single workshop instructor complimented that they said that the students were amazing. And I think the kind of work that came out was, was fabulous. Um, so uh, let's just see this hopefully as a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of the beginning of something new as a platform for debate that will hopefully be able to address a lot of different questions. But uh, thank you everyone for taking part today. I thought it was uh, extremely illuminating and um, Let's see what happens next. And just for a final comment to say that uh, we are next week, next Saturday, having a, um, uh, 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 another AI forum, what we call a Digital Futures Young. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning, but there's still a chance for people to uh, put in a submission for that. Um, uh, but Monday, uh, uh, 12 o'clock noon Eastern time. Um, uh, and, and, and let's see what happens there. So thank you everyone for taking part in this. Um, I found it very illuminating and uh, th thank you for the workshops themselves. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank bye you. Bye, bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, bye. Thank you.